I just some of the bits on the slides and through my presentation and hopefully she'll also be queuing me for time and stuff so I won't be going hopefully over uh, the 15 minutes. Okay, can um, everybody see the presentation up on the screen? This is the first time we've done this. Yes, it's great. Okay. Wow. Okay, Salman, the presentation is up, we're ready to go. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so my presentation is, is going to look at how uh, securitization uh, has affected Ahdi Muslim from uh, town to city. Um, Danny. And we will look at knowledge through gossip, rumours, suspicion and emotional and embodied knowledge and responses. Wonderful. OK, um, I'm going to begin my presentation by before I outline what my research aims and objective is and what my research is, is to just give you a couple of um, a few, uh, it's just the dates about uh, the Ahdi Muslim community. So we've got a bit of a timeline and some context. So therefore, it's easy for everyone to understand kind of what happened when it happened and then how that fits into this kind of uh, the embodied knowledge of gossip, rumour and suspicion and how that works into the Ahdi Muslim community. And it, and it kind of securitization that it faces in Pakistan. So if I begin by stating when it was formed, and that was at the first in our, in, on the first slide is the date, the summer of the date, which would begin by 1889, when the Ahmadiyya Muslim community was founded by Mirza Ghulam Ahmed in uh, a town called Kadian in India. And the important aspect here just to understand is that the community, the Ahmadi Muslim community, uh, the, the, the prophecy that the Mirza Ghulam Ahmed made was to actually be known as the promised reformer. It wasn't uh, another form of Islam or somehow um, uh, introducing new teachings, but it was to reinforce the teachings that were set out in the Holy Quran and by the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Um, the next important date on uh, to remember is uh, 1947, when Pakistan was founded and created after the partition. Um, and an important aspect of that is when it was founded was the Pakistan's first ever um, uh, foreign secretary was uh, Muhammad Zafrullah Khan. And he was he was the first ever um, foreign secretary, and he was an Ahmadi Muslim. And the relevance of that, I think, will become clearer uh, later on during my presentation. Then we move on to uh, nineteen forty nine, when the the Ahmadi Muslim community moved its headquarters from Kadian to Rabwa. Then we move on to 1974, and I think the most prominent date is something that will be kind of the underlying theme and, and what a lot of my presentation were referred to was the enactment of the blasphemy laws uh, in 1974. Um, and then we move on to 1984, uh, which is when General Ziaul Haq, the kind of the ruler of Pakistan, then introduced a legal ordinance, uh, which um, clearly stipulated within the constitution that Ahmadi Muslims were to be classified and be to be, to be legally classed as non-Muslim quite explicitly. Um, and that can be found in section 295 of the penal code as well. Um, and then we move on to 1984 as well, which is actually an important date because that was when the Mirza Tahir Ahmed, who was the fourth sort of successor to the uh, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, the promised messiah um, of the Ahmadi Muslim community, um, had to flee Pakistan because uh, of the uh, risk to his life and the fact that he would be arrested because he was then classed as an, because under the legal legislation was classed as a non-Muslim um, and he moved to London. So 
So those are some of the dates that I just wanted to kind of give a brief description of so um, we know what happened within kind of a chronological order and how that affects um, how the securitization occurred from town to city for Ahmadi Muslims. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're at five minutes and this is introduction to research. Right. The introduction to research. Okay, so my research is looking at gendered experiences of Islamophobia against Ahmadi Muslim women um, in the United Kingdom. And what, 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 what has driven me to this is because as an Ahmadi Muslim myself, um, the community is regarded as non-Muslim and and within the wider Muslim community, both in Pakistan and here in the United Kingdom. Um, and I wanted to begin to change the narrative about the Ahmadi Muslim community and to highlight how Ahmadi Muslim women had experienced everyday um, Islamophobia and how that affected their daily lives. Because within the current discourse and research, um, there is very little um, that is currently available about this and, and I felt that it was important to highlight this because it's not just Islamophobia within the non-Muslim sector from non-Muslims, it's something what you could call as, a, uh, uh, as intra-face or interface Islamophobia that exists uh, within the wider Muslim community towards the Ahmadi Muslim. So I wanted to explore what that meant and how that affects uh, Muslim, Ahmadi Muslim women. Danny, next, next bullet point, please. Okay, so we've got the quote from the blasphemy laws, which states, whoever by words, either spoken or written, or by visible representation, or by any imputation, innuendo, or insinuation, directly or indirectly, defiles the sacred name of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, shall be punished with death or imprisonment for life and shall also be liable to fine. Next slide, please. Ahmadis as others. Right, so, so the Ahmadi Muslim women, the Ahmadi, Ahmadi Muslims in Pakistan and especially in the fact that they're in Rabwa is really important because the geographical importance is something that I want to really stress upon simply because the fact that they've had to settle in a small town and be surrounded by just by to be, be surrounded in in one place because there's a fear to their life through gossip through innuendo through rumor and 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 and, and that heightens the suspicion of them being somehow um a threat to the Muslim community or the wider Muslim community. And that's a really, really important thing that I'd like to stress because there, this, this has made, made it so that Muslims are seen as, Ahmadi Muslims are seen as somehow being socially um, not accepted. And they're not, they're not able to access their mosques they're not able to assimilate in congregation. They're not able to uh, be politically uh, interactive with the political situation. And moreover, it hinders their everyday social welfare, i.e. talking, you know, accessing education um, and other services. Danny, next bullet point, please. So social ramifications. Right. Um, the social ramifications is really important because um, the, the behaviour that they've had to experience and their response, um, as, as is some kind of some of my case studies that I um, interviewed, has highlighted that it's become normalised. And, and for them, in order to get through it, to obtain uh, uh, you know, you know, an education, to access job opportunities, 
is that they've had to hide their 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 um, identity, who they are, what they are, you know, which is you know kind of a blatant disregard for their human rights, um, and the fact that it's become normalized is something which I find really worrying um, because it's, it's for many, for us in, 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 in Western society and in or based in the West, um, this, is, this is not normal, but for them, this is normal. And the fact that they have to face this on a day-to-day -day basis to be able to live, to be able to, access all opportunities is something which which is quite worrying and the fact that once they come out of their comfort zone and or come out of their their, their kind of protected zone out of Rabwa the kind of the geographical um significance becomes really important because once they're out of there there is no protection i.e the community is only able to obviously offer some some kind of protection within it uh society and community that exists within Rabwa, but once you're outside of that you're you're kind of left to kind of the community to support you emotionally and 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 in some way financially to a certain extent but but you're left to 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 survive and 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 you're able and, and you're still, and you're trying to survive within a community the wider Muslim community where through gossip and 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 through rumor, you are seen as a threat. So not only are you you are fearful, but you're vulnerable and you're insecure. Um, and I think the the other thing that 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 I would like to look at, and and something that came across was the fact that for the Muslim women. That, that I've interviewed who, who've talked about it and talked about the intra-faith Islamophobia that exists is the fact that in order for them to ascertain education, um, for them to build their lives, they have to come out and, and go into a, a society where, where they are intimidated, they are bullied, they are have been um, uh, they have been, um, you know, kind of picked on for who they are, what they are, and at the end, it it brought barriers. And once people have found out that they are Ahmadi Muslims, their lives have become harder. Um, and 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 I think that that's really important thing because at the end we come back to the underlying theme of this which is the normalization and that's what the blasphemy laws have have done it's normalized this and uh, this behavior and that's what's underpinned some of the experiences that my interviewees and case studies have have outlined about their lives and how they've lived and suffered once they've gone from town to city. We're at Next 13 slide. minutes, Salman. And the conclusion. Con right, conclusion, wonderful. Um, so where, where, where does this leave the Ahmadiyya Muslim community? Well, it leaves them still politically, geographically and socially as others, not only in Pakistan, but in the UK, and to outline this point further, in the United Kingdom, the Muslim Council of Britain still cites theological differences as the principal reason for not um, accepting and understand, not accepting Ahmadi Muslims as Muslim. And what does this lead back to is the blasphemy laws, because it's been outlined in the constitution of Pakistan, it's left Ahmadi Muslims all over, especially in the United Kingdom and in Pakistan as, as others. What does the future hold? The future holds hopefully more, more discourse, more engagement, more awareness. Um, and, and, and 
uh, with, with, with the opportunity to share some experiences of how the lived experiences of Ahmadi Muslims is, is being, um, is, is being sort of driven by uh, religion and being delivered, you know, and being uh, obstructed, you know, obstructed, you know, with the denial of basic human rights will hopefully enable us to begin a discourse, a discussion, conversation about what is right and, 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 and how we can stand up for basic human rights, which is what what we all aim to uh, uh, to see and to desire. I hope that that's given everyone a bit of an insight into um, uh, the kind of the Ahmadi Muslim community and the challenges that it faces. Um, this is my first presentation, so um, I hope I haven't sounded like I've just been going on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Sam, and that, that was wonderful. Uh, thank you for this really interesting presentation about a case where secrecy is a protective mechanism, but something that, that also is an outcome of exclusion, maintains exclusion. I'm sure we'll be talking more about it in the discussion sessions. So it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Mark Fenimore, who is a senior lecturer at Manchester Metropolitan University and has worked on East Germany on youth on the court war in Berlin. And he'll be telling us all about his talk now. Over to you, Mark. You're looking for the unmute button? So I was doubly muted. Um, just trying to get the uh, PowerPoint up. Okay. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> okay, so my title is Subverting the Panopticon and Outwitting the All-Hearing Ear. Telephonic Catfishing of the Enemy in Cold War Berlin. I should probably say that my background is, it is East Germany, it is Cold War, it is political history, uh, but it's also gender. And I'm particularly interested in the overlap between the two. So surveillance and the panopticon are supposed to be disarming, but what happens if a rogue agent reverses the direction of current? What happens if they turn the lens or microphone on itself? So the place I'm talking about is um, Friedrichshain. So Friedrichshain is, um, was a working class district of East Berlin, right on the border with West Berlin. In May 1951, the head officer at the police station noticed that a young man kept calling and talking to his telephonists. These tended to be attractive single young women employed to work on the switchboard at all hours. Such girls made up the neuralgic nerve center of the modern police system mediating between it and callers. Although physical beauty was not a necessity, thanks to sexist hiring practices, callers could be certain that none of the police telephonists were wallflowers. There was an expectation that they would be well-groomed, adroit, poised, and fashionable. So they have this caller. On further in investigation, the supervisor discovered that he was ringing from a British military base in Spandau. And this was on the other side of the Iron Curtain. With the onset of the Cold War in the summer of 1948, this ideological and discursive, but not yet physical barrier had descended on the city. Wolfgang strung the operators a line about having served in Saigon with the French Foreign Legion and invited them on dates. While he had approached a number of young women, two of his steadier girlfriends happened to be employed in the same call center. This was a source of personal as well as political tension.
proving to have an inexhaustible repertory of chat, most of it boastful mendacity. Wolfgang was a catfish avant la lettre. He insouciantly began toying with the Stalinist secret police disentangling the lies he casually told the operators from those he uttered to the Stasi in a desperate attempt to save his own skin is difficult. It appears that in July 1951, he was working as an armed German watchman at the British Schmutz barracks in Spandau. Although his main function was to guard military supplies as a night watchman, for the Stasi, his uniform and weapon made him a British mercenary. The initial suspicion that he was also working for French intelligence proved to be unfounded when two drunk women had remonstrated with him and his friend, the latter had pulled out a badge marked FBI to, to subdue them and had said that this was French intelligence. Under interrogation, Wolfgang admitted that his links to the French authorities in Berlin were nothing more than showing off. The closest he had come to French intelligence was attending a strip club in uh, the Quartier Napoleon barracks. And uh, strangely, he attended this with his sister and uncle Fritz. When he was off duty late at night, calling the operator girls on the phone was his main form of entertainment. Although the people's police supervisors disliked the defamatory jokes he told about the GDR, these seemed to amuse the operators. Although they were supposed to be ideological enemies, he presented himself as a colleague from over there. Fearing the effects of her bad company, Erica's religious parents had vainly tried to keep her on the straight and narrow by sending her to a convent in Torgau. In the eyes of the Stasi, Wolfgang had pursued both Waltraud and Erica for information. He'd been able to establish a rapport quickly because he already knew their names when he rang them the first time. His familiarity with details of their social standing, fashion preferences and media tastes helped in befriending them. Before each call, he knew exactly which buttons to press in relation to their favorite singers, preferred cafe or taste in film. Wolfgang was nosy as well as talkative. He was inquisitive about official police business and in particular sought the names, extension numbers and private addresses of senior police officials. One of his fiancés, Waltraud, said that she did not know why, but he kept pestering to see her police badge. When the Stasi arrested him, he incriminated himself by saying that his duty officer had tasked him with giving an envelope to a people's policeman in the underground toilets at Alexanderplatz. In return, he had received a packet of cigarettes. He was looking for an outlet for his demonstrable skills in social engineering. He had tried to get a job as a detective on the Stalin Alley. Um, they'd sent him to investigate a possible case of infidelity, but his investigations were unsatisfactory, so let him go. Wolfgang had a convoluted story about um, how he had pretended to be his friend Horst when he had befriended Erica. He said that Horst had given him her name and number because he was already engaged. Horst was supposedly a refugee from East Berlin and refused to go back there, saying, if I do, I'll end up in, with 15 years in Siberia. The two seemed to compete in weakening the Eastern system while nonchalantly wooing the girls. It's possible that Horst was just a figment of his imagination, um, his Tyler Durden, if you will. As a form of sophistry, Wolfgang had told Erica that it was possible that he had been an officer in the French Front Legion who had fought in Saigon. He had told other telephonists, Helga and Lillian, a similar story, that he had served for two years in Indochina. The reality was that he had joined twice but never got past basic training. While James Scott encourages historians of geopolitical borders to see like a state, Wolfgang and Erica encourage us to see like a misfit or a hacker. By reverse engineering the police switchboard to create his own personal realm of power or pleasure, Wolfgang demonstrated an unruly spirit of inventiveness and eigen sin. 
So this term eigen sin, it means essentially own sense. And it's the sense that you can create or, or maintain your own stubborn subjectivity, even in a dictatorship. So relations of power may have been asymmetrical, but neither Wolfgang nor Erica acted as if they were disempowered or cowed by the surveillance. In his hands, telephony could encourage closeness and intimacy. This is an example both of the murky espionage practices in the morass of divided four power Berlin and of romantic mores in early 1950s Germany. So with the betrothed joining forces with potential in-laws to thwart their rivals. Both practices involved a certain amount of subterfuge and misrepresentation, something we today refer to as catfishing. So you may be familiar with the 2010 film, um, it's a documentary called Catfish. In it, Vince Pierce describes such a lurking online peril as people who keep you on your toes. He told the allegory of fishermen who kept a catfish in the tank to prevent their cod from going mushy during long journeys. They keep you guessing, they keep you thinking, they keep you fresh. The threat prevents us from losing interest in life and turning sluggish. As early as 1913, campaigning journalist Henry Nevinson referred to the catfish as a stimulating corrective to the existence of lethargy and torpor. He went on to say that the demon of the deep not only kept things lively, but acted as a Faustian deus ex machina, naturally combating inertia. Nevertheless, he suggested that too many catfish in one tank would be a perilous situation. Left-wing liberal historian Arnold Toynbee argued that Soviet communism was fulfilling a similar mission by inspiring the capitalist West to offer better support and services to its population. Toynbee argued that communism represented the catfish of American society. By making the population more alert and lively, they performed a benign, almost providential function. Like the catfish, rivalry with a pressing, challenging Soviet adversary stimulated and stirred Western democracies out of stagnation and lethargy. Although they can have positive effects, catfish can also cause considerable pain and suffering. Criminals have always used whatever social media technology exists in order to con and abuse other people, usually for material gain. In the USA at around the same time that Wolfgang was active, Raymond Fernandez was carrying out the Lonely Heart murder spree. So essentially meeting victims through Lonely Heart columns. He had previously worked for British intelligence in Spain using his charm and charisma to loosen tongues. In the case of Wolfgang, the young couples rapidly progressed from strangers to acquaintances to rival sets of engaged lovers. If they did not engage in fully fledged phone sex, the rival courting couples did indulge in flirtation akin to foreplay. What began as a minor deception aimed at impressing members of the opposite sex led to a four-year sentence for espionage. His prison mugshot shows a miserable young man with a shaven head. So the study of relationships as captured by surveillance lends itself to an assessment of psychology and emotion, as well as laws and regulations. It was unthinkable for Wolfgang's parents for two young people to be in a face-to-face -face amorous relationship without being betrothed. Politically, the case reveals that contemporaries had very different internalized assumptions to those we would expect. At this early stage of the Cold War, the dividing line between East and West was diffuse and blurred. Given the power of opposite sex attraction, the thin nylon curtain was a fragile barrier that was easily ripped and torn. The fact that both Waltraud and Erica pushed for engagement suggests that they did not fully deserve their dubious reputation, though the speed and overlapping nature of their betrothals does raise concerns. Social norms expected a woman with decorum to wait passively for the phone to ring rather than initiating the call herself, 
young women who demonstrated greater energy and resolve could easily be seen as call girls. If for writer Mark Twain, telephone conversations constitute the queerest of all queer things in the world, the love triangle recorded by the Stasi is testimony to the power of whispered sweet nothings as transmitted across the yawning political divide by something as intangible as electrical current. All three people in it were to some extent leading exciting double life. Wolfgang, Waltraud and Erica's border straddling telephonic love triangle upturns the usual tropes of surveillance and listening in. It suggests not just that the realities were significantly more entangled and complex than top-down narratives would suggest, but also that subjective ventures of selfhood remain stubbornly animated and unruly, with ordinary Berliners actively deploying a panoply of aural and other tricks. Contrary to our assumptions, the People's Police girls exhibited nonchalance rather than nervousness in relation to the technology and its political ramifications. Although sworn to secrecy, the telephonist's social and cultural interests made them less security conscious than was ideal. Their interest in exchanging gossip undermined the exchange's security. The Cold War love triangle inverted the usual power relations depicted in Stasi surveillance. Wolfgang's playful insertion of himself into the telephone network of the People's Police as a strange, almost parasitic ghost in the machine or gremlin gives us some intriguing insights into the interactions between bio and geopolitics. As poet John Liley argued, all is fair in love and war. Throwing off the shackles of conventional morality, Wolfgang was a rogue agent. Behind him, he left a trail of broken hearts, not least his own. The messiness of the emotional crossed wires tell us more about the realities of human nature than does the Cold War on its own. Thank you. Um, that was great. What an interesting example. Um, again, I'm sure we'll have lots to talk about in the discussion session. So I will move swiftly on to introducing our final speaker of this first part of the session today. That is Dr. Rosalie Stolz, who's a researcher at the Institute for Ethnology, which I would translate as social anthropology, um, but that's debatable at Heidelberg University, works on socioeconomic change, kinship and sociality in northern Laos. Um, over to you. Thank you very much, Anselma, and to the whole team of your research project for having me here. I mean, here online in the castle. I'm going to share my screen just a second. So, yeah, so thanks again to you. And the title of my presentation is Unknowing Spirits, Secrecy, Stories, and the Pitfalls of Knowing in Upland, Northern Laos. I'm going to go into the presentation mode. Yeah, all right. So let's start in Medias Res with the example from, from Northern Laos. So talk about spirits and malevolent spirits in particular among the Gamu of Northern Laos is often surrounded by secrecy and silence. The sudden change in atmosphere on an ordinary evening in a Gamu village revealed to me that a small incident might bear larger significance. Mahak, Makwai, Masen and I sat watching television and doing our handicrafts in Makwai's house. A house that is quite similar to the one that you can see here on this, this slide. So we were sitting inside the house, but all of a sudden then, Marcin prompted me to leave by uttering Chu, the Gamu term for descending from the house or leaving. The next second, Marcin and Mahak were already about to hurry down the stairs. What happened? I asked Marcin, who went back home in the same direction as myself. She responded, didn't you hear the eagle cry? When I asked her where the eagle was, she nodded her hat briefly in one direction and sat over there, nigh. When Marcin exclaimed leave or descent from the house, the fact that she omitted the reason for doing so was telling. Mahak obviously drew her own conclusions and rose in unison with us. When I asked, as a local adult of course wouldn't need to do, why we were in such a hurry to leave, her explanation remained unclear when looking solely at the words. 
an eagle was heard crying. I mean, so what? This proposition must remain indefinite to anyone unaware that the eagle's cry signifies a haunting tiger spirit. Massen didn't mention the tiger spirit by name, nor did she use the word for spirit at all. So spirits, from the Gamut point of view, are invisible and intangible beings that bear the potential of affecting human lives for better or worse, in the case of a haunting tiger spirit, of course, only for worse. Accordingly, the local gloss for spirit belief is to fear the spirits, Ngoroi. Eluding the human gaze, spirits loom large in ordinary narratives, in gossip and rumors. Incidents, also very brief incidents, such as the one I mentioned, are secretly narrated among neighbors in order to gauge the closeness and activity of malevolent spirits. The newest twists of spirit stories shape the light in which experiences and perceptions are interpreted and motivate the cautious measures that locals apply to avert harm. The Camus, whose lives unfold in a world that it's not only occupied by humans and animals and so on, but also by spirits, could be said to follow stories as if they were traces. And indeed, regarding the invisibility of spirits, stories are the most accessible traces that spirits seem to leave. And I'd like to give you, or to flesh the example a bit more out because we have uh, such a diversity of papers here and case studies. I'd like to give you one such story, at least a part of it, um, not for exoticizing this case, but rather to showing that the locals have a stake in these stories. It began at a lively afternoon feast during the annual village ritual in May 2014. My female companion and I went in a cheerful mood and in our best skirts to attend the feast at a wife giver's house, where she became then immersed in a tiddly talk with another woman. Suddenly, a tear ran down this other woman's face. She told me that her daughter, already a big girl of about 10 years old, had died. She drowned in the river. At the time, I wasn't sure when this had happened, whether weeks ago or years. And I was stunned that a girl of that age could have drowned in the small creek that I had in mind in the dry season. Then weeks later, after the rains had started, the narration became refined as well as my understanding because they saw that the river was, or the creek was swollen. A decade ago, almost a decade ago, then during a village-wide taboo accompanying the inauguration of the rice harvest, the girls' parents returned from the field hut where they'd been watching the ripening rice and wet fetching vegetables. They entered the village with their net bags full of chilies used for every meal and other green vegetables, thereby ignoring the richer prohibition of importing green things into the village. It was perhaps the same day that children and youngsters who bathed in the swollen stream ran into the village to fetch an adult. They came across Yong Man and told him that they'd lost sight of their friend, Nang Si. Yong Man came with them to the river to search for the girl and found her lifeless body at a bend farther downstream. She must have entangled her feet in her skirt and most unfortunately drowned. Ever since then, the place where Nang Si was found has been prohibited for her parents, as it could be said to be haunted. Now, that was now in 2014, years later, the girl's tragic drowning accident became the background to a young man's spirit-afflicted madness. Young man who'd found the drowned girl started to behave awkwardly. Eventually, he started to burst into shouts and behave aggressively without aim or reason. The silence about these events was striking. No one dared to suggest what was happening. While our neighbors aimed to shield us, we didn't fail to notice the several rituals that were sternly being prepared and also rather ad hoc healing rituals like the one you can see here on this picture. Young man's kin was seemingly occupied by this problem, providing several guards to oversee his whereabouts day and night. When much later his condition was restored and he in fact behaved normally again without any memory of what had befallen him, his classificatory mother Marcin told me of the efforts and sacrificed animals um, that they put into healing him. Uh, for instance, also such figures uh, were used uh, during also ad hoc healing rituals. So she emphasized one particular instance of his strange behavior. Repeatedly, he walked in a daze to the river where he'd once found Nang Si. 
One time he sneaked out and went to the river, but young man lost consciousness before he fell into the river, unfortunately. According to Marcin, it was Nang Si, her spirit still at the river, that called him to her to join her as a restless spirit. Young Man's affliction wasn't caused, however, by the spirit alone. Once a spirit has found a way to afflict a person, it is as if the gates have opened, allowing other spirits to sneak in and to add to the malady. Some people related this cause of events to the spiritual danger that his father's brother's inappropriate marriage brought over the whole house. Confidentially, a neighbor raised the suspicion that the splitting spirit a spirit feared for becoming active after such inappropriate marriages, might have afflicted the young man. From another neighbor's point of view, Marcin's fate to attract bad luck, about which another story secretly circulates, contributed to young man's susceptibility, at least, to intruding spirits. Both additional versions of spirit affliction were raised among closely related persons and were concluded always with the cautious remark, Talau Am, don't tell anyone. Worse, it turned out that this case was particularly problematic and that Yong Man was close to becoming the victim of the much feared malevolent tiger spirit, a witch spirit that I mentioned at the beginning. Late one evening, Masu joined Masen and me at a fireplace outside. Worried as she seemed to be, she spoke under her breath to Marcin so as not to be hurt by others. A middle-aged woman in the neighboring village had suddenly become paralyzed and couldn't speak or eat. She just sat apathetically inside the house and died after a short time. Because of these symptoms, paralysis, the inability to speak, it was assumed that the witch had eaten her. The witch wasn't named, but secretly identified nevertheless. Masseur was well aware that a few months ago, Marcin was fined for voicing her suspicion that there were witches originating from this village, so the village in which we sat. Worse than the fine, it was feared that her classificatory son, Yong Man, was to become a victim as revenge for her accusation. Masseur confirmed to Marcin that it was this witch who also tried to intrude into Yong Man. He'd been saved only because of all the ritual measures that had been taken. So to briefly now zoom out of this, uh, this vignette, uh, let's come to the closer to the topic of knowledge and secrecy that's included also in this story. From the Camus point of view, spirits, as I said, are invisible. Usually uh, humans cannot get any glimpses on them. They can be sometimes seen in dreams or communicate their messages or they can be heard via auditory indicators, such as the cries of specific birds, such as the eagle mentioned at the beginning. So sensing spirits is thereby not a detached, detached mode of perception, but always bears the potential of becoming affected. Among the gamu, the term for coming across a spirit by whatever perceptual means, Bupuroi is the same as becoming inadvertently and, well, most often undesirably, affected by the same spirit. The agency of spirits, which is often vague and indeterminate, yet powerfully transgressive, is of vital concerns for locals. And this leads us to the problem of knowability. The invisibility of spirits has epistemological consequences, as from the local point of view, Knowability presupposes visibility. To see, to observe something is synonymous with comprehending, knowing it. Vice versa, lack of knowledge is usually explained by reference to not having seen something, perhaps adding that one heard only others say so, the latter being vaguer than knowledge generated from self-observation. The notorious invisibility of spirits apparently makes them a dubital subject of proper knowledge, and rather a suitable topic of doubt, with which I wish to refer to Niels Buban's work on doubt. In fact, the official local truth is that there is no such thing as malevolent spirits, at least not in that village, at least not today. The public secret, if you will, however, is that they do exist, in fact. This claiming of ignorance not to know about certain spirits, they don't exist, I don't know, is related to the efficacy of verbalizing knowledge. Spirit knowledge is far from a neutral passive reflection just for the sake of it, as also Michael Lumbeck noted. Instead, admitting to knowing about spirit matters is equal to submitting to them. 
Liana Shua has shown that the Bidayu of Sarabak exhibit ignorance on the matters of traditional spirit knowledge in order to disentangle themselves from the implications of knowing. By admitting spirit knowledge, Chua argues, the knower recognizes the spirits as well as the human spirit ties and social relations that have actualized those spirits in the first place. When acknowledging the spirits, the knower obligates herself to the bundle of spirit ties and to whole sets of relations that these ties are part of. Relations the knower is never in full control of. Against this background, claiming ignorance enables one to await to uh, quote Liana Chua, the potentially disempowering drawbacks of knowing, unquote. The Gamu are similarly concerned with the efficacy of knowledge. To know about something means to recognize its subject and at the same time to be obliged to act upon it. By displaying kinship knowledge, for instance, kinship knowledge, for instance, by skillfully applying kin terms and gifting, potential kin ties are transformed into efficacious ones, as I, may sh I show in my recent book. The other way around, children are characterized as knowing nothing. So the local saying is, children know nothing. This is not, to, not meant to ridicule uh, children, but to avert harm from them. A richer prohibition that a child can't possibly know about is a prohibition that a child can't be punished for ignoring. Beneath the level of publicly recognized spirit knowledge, there is another mode of what I call gorging spirit presence. What I call to gorge here bears a resemblance to the gamut term met, which encompasses hearing about something, perceiving something by whatever sensory means, or rising to one's awareness. The term gorging allows one to approach the perception, suspicions, and narratives that locals continue to consider, even though they might claim not to know about them. So I'd like to, to stop here at this point and then later come to more comparative remarks to perhaps the other cases or the topic of this webinar series. But for this ethnographic case, I'd like to stop here. That's great. Thank you very much, Rosalie. Right on time. And I'll be looking forward to, to hearing those comparative points. Um, so we have a little bit of time for discussion of these first three papers, but as I said, we'll have a little bit less time uh, allocated to this because we want to have more time at the very end for discussion of all the papers together. And that is um, because, as I didn't explain, when we had to move, this session was meant to be two webinars, one on knowledge through gossip and rumors and suspicion, and one on emotional and embodied knowledge and responses. Um, and due to industrial action, we had to merge the two webinars so that the papers are now mixed up. So they're not thematically separated anymore, which is why we're keeping more discussion and uh, time towards the end. Um, however, um, very often pieces just kind of fall together. And there are, of course, overlapping topics in these three papers. Um, and what what strikes me is Rosalie's point, um, the sense that knowing something means it obliges us to, to act up on it. So it, it calls for some kind of agency or reaction or response um, if there's knowledge, which is, which is interesting. And I think we can see this maybe to degree also in Salman's paper, so when the surrounding community has a sense to a suspicion or gossip of who might be an Ahmadi Muslim, then they feel it has some kind of, it has an effect, it has an effect on those people. It has an impact. So we can see that there. Um, with Mark's paper, I'm trying to get my head around this, how, how that would work. Um, Mark, could, would you like to think through this question a little bit maybe? So I think for me, it's um, I was surprised by Wolfgang's agency. I would expect the whole weight of surveillance to be disempowering. Um, it's strange that he did the four years for supposed espionage for essentially catfishing. But when he came out, he um, became a tout. So he was engaged in similar kinds of um, low level espionage activity because I couldn't work out why he was still in prison like 15 years later. 
Um, I think he's representative of some groups within German society um, where they couldn't really pick a side in the Cold War and they kept going back and forth from one to the other. Um, I think it's, he's interesting as well in that it's such an early period, 1951. Um, I mean, the border was open till 1961, there's a lot to and fro going back and forth. Um, knowing something requires agency or response. Um, I'm not sure how I apply that to historical work as opposed to an anthropological one, but maybe the anthropologist could come in and I'll come back if there's something to add. Yeah, I think it's 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 interesting uh, this point that um, Wolfgang might have been he might have been part of a group of people who were refusing to take sides um, in a way using their agency to to pervade the secrecy that that was rising all around them due to due to the partitioning up of not only Berlin but not only Germany but the world as such during during the Cold War. Um, so I can see I can see a connection there in a slightly different way. But I'm opening up the floor um, if anybody has any questions for our three speakers. Or if there are any other comments either from Salman um, or Rosalie. Jan? No, I had a question also in terms of um, thinking about comparisons. I had a question for Salman. Um, I'm interested in um, what he said about the work he's doing between the UK and, and Pakistan um, and the way that rumours work to ostracise or alienate women in these contexts. And Salman, I wonder if you could just say a little bit more, please. Have, have you looked at the way rumour works in the two contexts and are you able to, to draw any comparisons or similarities or have you mainly focused just on on women within the uk context i just give someone a moment because so it might be i uh, can you hear me there we go um, you know, but, but, but you know, your, your question's really interesting. Um, I think I think there is an overlap. Yes, I mean, despite the fact that my my kind of my, my 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 principal focus is on, um, you know, kind of Afghan Muslim in women in the UK, but but from my case studies and the participants that I've interviewed, the majority of them have had an upbringing or have led some or the majority of their life in Pakistan before they've migrated. So I think that, that, that what's really interesting is the fact that you can contrast both, both kind of experiences and see where the kind of the, the issues arise and, and, and what happens um, and how it kind of gives you a contrast between how rumour and gossip has kind of followed them in a way because 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 so we I mean we'd have a lot of freedoms here in the UK and, and everything else. At the end, at the end, a lot of their contact and their identity and their belonging is is still within the Muslim community. And that's not just in the Afghan Muslim community, it's just with other Muslims as well, simply because you know they are working or their education or or, or or you know just in social settings as well. I hope I've made some sense there. Yeah, 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 you have, um, you know, especially the last point, I think, I think is really clear that, of course, they, they still have a sense of belonging with the wider Muslim community. And of course, they would also want to belong. Um, I imagine also that's also important because it is quite a minority group, wouldn't it be? Yeah, yeah, ab ab absolutely. And, and, and the fact that, you know, it's a very small minority among kind of the wider Muslim sort of community and society and, 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 and kind of that, that I guess is, is, is 
really kind of what what makes it really interesting and in, in seeing how the transition has occurred from say Pakistan to the West. Any other just gonna have a quick look. See if there are any other questions, comments? So, Rosalie, I wonder, is there a gendered aspect at all uh, to your work? Thank you. I was um, well wondering, first of all, there is another post in the chat by Robert Williams, if you want to take this first. Um, Pardon? <laughs> there is a question. I don't know at whom is it, uh, whom, who is it addressing? In the chat, no, it's, I think it's posted to, so it's visible for all. I can't, I can't see it. Perhaps. And I can't read it. Mm -hmm. Shall I read it out on Selma? Yes. <laughs> um, so, so Robert says, knowing something generates agency through choice between action or non-action. Well, that's, it, he's posed it as a question. So does it, does it generate agency through choice between action and non-action? He says, the case of Kitty M. Genovese in the 1960s and the cooperative false narrative of bystander apathy constructed between the major and, um, sorry, and the mayor and the newspaper editor might speak historically to this question. Many so-called bystanders were proactive that night. This is not a context I'm familiar with. Um, maybe, maybe Robert would be happy to, to expand on that a little bit if, if Robert feels comfortable to do that. Well, can you hear me? Yes, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, so it's six o'clock in the morning here in Ohio. <laughs> Great um, that you could join us then. <laughs> I, I do spend part of my time in the UK, mostly in Walsall, uh, north side of the Birmingham conurbation. The whole topic, uh, secrecy, appealed to me since my days in the 964th AWAC squadron during the early 80s. As an assistant squadron historian, I produced histories for public consumption, but there were sorties that were not included in those histories. And who compiled those and if they were even compiled or sent anywhere, I don't know. But it was Anselma's question um, about agency that brought back, that, you know, re brought to my mind the case of Kitty Genovese. We, for, long, for years, thought that no one did anything during the 30 minutes that she was crying out for help, we were told. And the whole apartment complex full of uh, bystanders did nothing. Well, that we found out was a false narrative. There were indeed people who were calling the police and opening their windows and shouting at the assailant and he ran off. And they didn't know that he had pierced her lung from behind with a knife strike. And they thought she was okay as she continued walking and he ran in the opposite direction. Well, the city, um, <laughs> constructed this false narrative because the, the whole town was ready to explode in, in, in racial riots over police injustice and brutality. They had, uh, well, anyway, so I just wanted, this, this is an interesting concept, you know, this decision between action and non-action, knowing something. I, I guess it speaks to me personally, I know things. And uh, <laughs> what do you do about knowing things? <laughs> it's, uh, it's a good question that Anselma brought up. I, I, I guess I just thought maybe somebody could speak to it. I don't know, in a theoretical general way. 
Right, thank you. Uh, it's a, it's a good, good point. Um, so it seems that in Rosalie's example, there's a strong discourse that knowledge come, you know, obliges you to, to take action, to do something, to respond. But that is, that's not the case in, in all societies necessarily or in all historical contexts. So maybe sometimes that is not, that is not what happens. Um, you know, in Mark's case, I think it seems more about the seeking out of knowledge and that that is how agency is, is taken. Um, but um, are there any responses from anybody else? There's, of course, also the action of the police then um, for Wolfgang, right? That um, the, the knowledge gained about him through his phone calls and his catfishing then leads to leads to another another party taking action against him. Is that another way of looking at it? I think so. I mean, I, I'm, I'm always surprised to do something about hackers and not to be Zoom bombed. Um, so that's a bit boring. Um, but I think for me, it was looking at um, the first hackers were called phone freaks. And they would essentially get free phone calls, some of them by imitating the codes, uh, the sort of sounds that the telephone system used. Um, and some of them were blind uh, and that helped them in that ability to be able to outwit the system. So one of the most famous guys, um, uh, was an expert in social engineering. So I think that's what, to some extent, Wolfgang's um, abilities represented was his ability to talk people into doing stuff that they didn't, they shouldn't have done. So he could do this in a variety of different contexts, and one of them was using the phone. Great, thank you. And and as he explained, I think he used he used knowledge he'd gained about the individuals he was speaking to in, in order to do that and, and knowledge or pretend pretended knowledge and and yeah um, that was his expertise. I mean maybe we trust people who are slightly familiar to us and that um just the, knowing your name and knowing details about you is enough to overcome your resistance or your suspicion. Yeah. Joanne? I was I wanted to pick up on something Rosalie said about children, because I thought that was fascinating that, that you assume that children don't know, so therefore they can't be punished for not presumably acting upon the knowledge they don't have. Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about um, age in relation to this and at what point this not, not being allowed to not know <laughs> shifts into adulthood and being expected to know and, and, then, and then act. Can you say something about that borderline transition between young people and, and older? Thank you, Jean, for this for this question. Well, actually, I gave this example of the children just as a side example to show that this pertains not only to spirits and the realm of religion or animism, but rather it's kind of part of local ways of seeing the relationship between knowing something and the things that are out there and the consequences of knowing. So local epistemologies, if you wish. So the children, yeah, but the children, with this really commonly said, children know nothing. And it really means, as, as you also um, reiterated, that they are not punished. And often they are not that much punished as they are also in Euro-American context. So shouting at children, especially small children, is seen as pointless because the children don't know about certain things. So there is no point in scolding them harshly. And it's also connected to some other considerations. However, the, when the children start knowing, uh, knowing by well, observing how the adults are behaving, and they start, for instance, to use kin terms properly, or they know proper conduct, um, which the adults can see by merely observing the conduct of the children, then they are granted 
that they know something. And then, of course, also the expectation towards the children rise. That's also the same, of course, for the ethnographers or foreigners coming to a village, standing, uh, staying there for a longer time period, where they first don't know and are not made responsible for trespassing, prohibitions or proper rules of conduct. Then with showing the ability to behave according to local norms, for instance, showing proper behavior, uh, saying the right words to the right persons, then of course your status changes and the responsibility. But this is something that is of course um, more relevant, not only in the GAMU case, but also elsewhere. But the interesting point is here, I'd like to say, is that there is some efficacy tied to knowledge. So showing knowledge, admitting knowledge means also that, um, as Anselma said, um, obliging oneself to the consequences it might have. And knowing means also to recognize the implications of, of knowing more widely. Yeah, thank you for this question. <laughs> thank you, that's great. Yes, any more comments? Sarah. Hi, thanks, Asama. Thanks for these three papers. Um, I'm sorry, I, I missed quite a bit of the first one, having a family crisis this morning. Um, I, I'm really interested in this discussion about knowledge and obligation, and particularly, um, I didn't know who Kitty Genovese was, but I've just looked up the story. Um, and um, this idea that knowing something creates an obligation also for bystanders. Um, and then in that context, so if I've understood Wikipedia correctly, um, while she was being murdered, uh, the New York Times presented the story that there were 30, or the state presented the story that there were 38 witnesses um, who had done nothing. Um, and then that turned out not to be true. And I wanted to ask our presenters if they had any thoughts about the kind of relationship between knowledge as obligation um, and um, the use of that knowledge as obligation as a, as a form of power as well. Um, so Robert, if I've understood correctly, they, they did that in order to kind of divert attention from, from the murder of this woman um, it, by saying you know, people didn't respond and they should have done, therefore it's their responsibility and not, not our responsibility. And is, that, is, there a, is there that connection then between knowledge, obligation, um, and the use of knowledge as, as a form of power by saying people should have known and therefore they should have done something and therefore it's it's a passing on a kind of diverting of responsibility as well. I do hope that made some kind of sense. Rosalie, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So not to this specific a horrific case, it seems, but more generally, well, I'd say this claiming of, of ignorance, claiming of not to know, is certainly a state evading or power evading strategy, something that could be described as James Scott terms as a weapon of the weak. So what I described this um, claiming not to know about malevolent spirits, for instance, or claiming not to know about certain Legitimate, legitimate, legitimate practices going on and uh, claiming this towards police or, police or state officials in the case of, of Laos, um, where you have also enormous power asymmetries, like the power asymmetries to a certain extent between humans and spirits. There are also massive asymmetries involved between um, the citizens, such as uplanders especially, minority populations, and the state in the Lao People's Democratic Republic. And so claiming not to know something, also towards state officials, is a way, of course, of evading their power. It's a kind of resistance strategy, you could say, to some extent. But this is only one layer, I must say. But I'd like to perhaps um, stop here and give voice to the other um, panelists. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Mark. Uh, I, th I think this is related to also something Rosalie was talking about. I mean, what I was getting is that as an ethnographer or a, an anthropologist, you, you need to know the social cues of the society you're embedding with. And that at this, it's for this reason that I'd be terrible as an anthropologist. I don't manage the um, social cues in English. And so it would be difficult for me to do it in a different society. But I think in my case, Wolfgang was expert at this. He was expert at placing people, at communicating with them, at coding and decoding the sort of social interactions. 
as that that gave him power. Um, I don't know if this is unfair to say, but um, what's the role of the anthropologist's power in these kind of situations? Um, do you, is it something you're conscious of when you're, you're doing the studies or? Um, Would you like to respond, Rosalie, or um, should we should we leave the comment for the break and return to it later? Well, this is up to you as a moderator. <laughs> so I could say something to this. I like it's a very important point, certainly. Yeah, and it's it's a point that's been that's been well debated for a long time in anthropology as well. So there's there's a big discourse around these kinds of questions. Um, but maybe it's something to, yes, to also bear in mind and think about, think through these connections between knowledge, action, agency, power, and um, symmetries, asymmetries uh, in power relationships. And maybe we can carry that into the second session. Um, thank you very much, our, our speakers and um, our people asking, uh, commenting, the audience commenting and asking questions, but I would like to just um, call for a break now so we all get a chance to step away from the screen and maybe run and do whatever it is that we need to do to feel comfortable for the next slot. Um, so we will reconvene at um, half past at 11.30 UK time in, in approximately 12 minutes. Thank you very much. And could I just really quickly ask, do we have um, Gareth Brain online yet? Um, I haven't seen him yet online. Um, I know, he, but we've got somebody who's dialed in on a mobile that I can't see a name. Um, so I don't know whether that's Gareth or not. He said he would join from his office, but he is running late because of teaching. Okay, right. So, so well, I'll double check with be, him. Yeah, hopefully he'll be with us after the break or, or soon thereafter. All right, thank you very much and see you shortly. Bye.
Okay, we're just at half past now, so maybe we can um, maybe can we we can make a start. Okay, I can see some really um, interesting comments coming up in the, in the chat, which we'll try and pick up after the next round of um, after the next round of papers. So welcome to the second part of the, um, the seminar. My name is Joanne Sainer and I'm a senior lecturer in cultural and heritage studies at uh, the University um, in Newcastle. And it's my very great pleasure to introduce um, our next three uh, speakers. Um, I'll introduce them them um, all at the beginning and then we'll take the papers uh, in turn and we'll take the questions um, at the end of those three papers, have some chance to, to ask questions specifically to our next three speakers and then to draw in um, some links between the papers that, that we heard uh, earlier uh, where we can. Um, so uh, I'll introduce our next few speakers then. Apologies in advance if I pronounce uh, the names in, incorrectly. I didn't have a chance to check with everybody before we came online. Um, but our first uh, speaker um, is um, Pradeepa Rasidi, who is a digital rights program officer for Engage Media in Indonesia. Um, he's previously worked at the universities of Amsterdam, on activism and the public sphere and at the University um, in, of Indonesia. Um, he will be talking to us um, about uh, the turning us to understand curating Twitter secrets and disinformation in the public of, of distrust. So um, Pradeepa will set, set us off and um, we'll then move to Dr. Uh, Anarienka Fula, who's an independent scholar from uh, the Netherlands. She's previously worked at the University of Amsterdam uh, and as a PhD researcher in the EAS, ERC project, Problematizing Muslim Marriages. Uh, and she's talking today on discretion and doubt, alternating modes of molding uncertain truths. And then our third speaker is Dr. Gareth Breen, who's associate lecturer in medical anthropology at University College London. Um, he did his PhD in anthropology in the London School of Economics in 2020, um, researching on Taiwan, and I think drawing on some of the works today uh, that he's done for his paper on We Found the Secret of Living, Power, Presence and Secrecy in the Global Christian Following. So they will be talking for about 15 minutes um, each. Uh, and in the same in the first part, uh, if we go over the 15 minutes, then um, I will interrupt um, kindly and tactfully, uh, so that we'll get a chance to talk uh, uh, and listen to um, and respond to their comments. Okay, so we'll move first then to um, Pradeepa. Would you like to, would you like to screen share or would you would just like to talk to us? Yeah, I'd like to screen share, Dr. John. Okay, then go ahead. It should be enabled for you. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Joan and everyone here. Hello, I'm Pradipa. I'm presenting, going to present my uh, presentation based on my field work uh, in Jakarta, Indonesia. Uh, this is still a work in progress, so please, your criticism and feedback. So this question is based um, from the, uh, the paper is based on a question what if digital, digital literacy is not enough because in many disinformation studies, uh, many solutions offered to this information is to work on digital literacy. So the equation is more digital literacy means more less dis disinformation. But from my case, I, I'm wondering what if the people who dis disseminated this information are very digitally literate. So I think to discuss this matter, it would be beneficial to discuss this information through the lens of secrecy. Um, my field work is focused on Twitter based on uh, online and offline ethnographic field work in 26, 2016 and 2017 with Twitter influencers. Uh, those influencers disseminated this information but were not, uh, did not partake uh, in, in this information campaign. And the other is with political buzzers or uh, this organized disinformation campaigners who are actively involved in those campaign. Um, sorry, oops. Okay. So 
uh, the disinformation campaign revolves around uh, the rumors about uh, Islamic Caliphate in Indonesia. Uh, it is revolved around this pamphlet. So this might seem strange because Indonesia is statistically Muslim majority, but those uh, statistical data is because forced conversion in the 65 communist purge, because Indonesia have six officially recognized religions, Islam, Protestantism, Catholics, Hindu, and Buddhism, and more recently Confucianism. But during the communist purge, Indonesians who did not hold those religions were accused as communists, and there were many forced conversions to Islam and Christianity. Uh, Indonesia itself is ethnically diverse, uh, and it boasts uh, 1,000 ethnic groups. So despite the statistical majority of Muslim in Indonesia, uh, the role of Islam in the public sphere is always debated and negotiated. In 2017, 27, uh, 27, uh, 16 to 17, those debates uh, surface again during the Jakarta election when um, the incumbent governor, Christian, Christian Chinese minority incumbent governor named Ahok ran for candidacy and he was pit against Anis, the Arab Muslim contender. So during the during their candidacy, there was a huge rally called uh, 212. The rally accused Ahok of blasphemy and demand him to be to be jailed. Um, during the rally, many scholars have since then noted uh, the rally has more to do with Ahok's controversial policies that displays urban poor and grievance directed at central government um, for not accommodate, accommodating public spaces for religious ritual. But at the time, uh, journalists, academics, and civil society, and many people like uh, the dominant narrative around them was how Indonesia secularism was threatened by the Islamist rally, and there was a perceived rise of intolerance at the time. Um, which bring us to the spread of conspiracy theory regarding uh, the purported establishment of Sharia state. Throughout this paper, I will I'm in agreement with the work of Kabanes and my own that uh, to understand this information, we need to understand the context of people consumption with media. Um, so, so I'm uh, speeding through this section. So to understand how this information is spread on Twitter, we need to understand how people use Twitter. Uh, the actors, the actors here are uh, Twitter influencers. Uh, they resemble uh, television celebrities, but they wanted to close the gap between themselves and their audience. So in order to close this, those gap, they keep sharing about their personal stories, experience, and they also maintain close uh, parasocial interaction with their audience. And through this media, through this interaction, uh, influencer maintain uh, media ideology that uh, they perceive that Twitter is considered as a authentic platform, more authentic platform, less, less tendency to be fake compared to platforms like Facebook or Instagram because they think that uh, on Twitter, people are being honest with themselves and not curated, not uh, fake, quote unquote, like uh, Instagram. So in short, Twitter was considered as a medium to not only find stories, uh, but also to seek truth or in the words of one informant, to see what's happening around in Indonesia or Jakarta, because uh, Twitter is perceived as a public uh, places. So back to the 2017 election, uh, during the Islamist rally, uh, at the time people uh, had difficulties in understanding what's going on. So there, was, when the rally happened, um, people were quick to point fingers to Ahok's opponent, that is Anis Baswedan, uh, which is considered as supporting the Islamist rally. Uh, the person Anis himself did not say he support the rally, but he also did not condemn the rally. Instead, he visited one prominent figure in the rally called Habib Rizik. And although what was exactly discussed during his visit was unknown, but it was enough for people to feel that something is going on behind the screen. Moreover, the president himself did not take any action, further planting the idea that something might be going on, that there is something conspiratorial to jail uh, Ahok uh, uh, due to blasphemy. So this relates to what Patricia Spire said as hyperhermeneticism, the compulsive need to interpret and mind just about everything for hidden meaning to see any trivial occurrence as sign of omen and what might to come. So what they see at the time is partial knowledge and Twitter would help, they think, in revealing those partial knowledge. So following the rally uh, and Anis lack or response uh, to the rallies, 
uh, on Twitter there were many circulation of uh, image and videos about uh, people donning white garbs and jackets with Arabic uh, Arabic text and in such uh, tweets people would begin the sentence like I saw the I saw these people when I was passing through this road or I received this video from somewhere so uh, I talked to one informant who says that he received an information quote unquote making the impression that uh, the thing he received he heard has a factual data when it was actually just a hearsay and it's this release is also equated as anti-Indonesia as the people that this really is funded by uh, Saudi Arabia, those Wahhabis, quote unquote, and they perceive this as uh, uh, a Wahhabi or Saudi Arabia conspiracy to topple Indonesia of the ethnic diversity. So figures of Islamic, uh, figures of those people, figures of really became a faction, a product of political elimination that is simultaneously fictional and real. So this faction is always shrouded in opacity, although evidence of its existence appears in this, in this table. So uh, while all of this cannot be verified, however, uh, from my interviews with cyber troops or political buzzer, as we call it here, uh, those disinformation, disinformation campaign uh, was indeed involved in uh, spreading false rumors about uh, Islamic Caliphate. Uh, first, they would pretend to be victims of uh, um, anti-Chinese sentiments. So during the, the time of the rally, there were rumors that uh, there were increasing anti-Chinese anti sentiments in Jakarta that people were harassed by by Islamists because of being Chinese. But uh, although some of those stories are true, some of those stories are uh, purposely fabricated by this organization, this organized campaign. And second, the, this organized campaign also pretend to be Islamist racist, so so they would pretend as the other side. They would spread vile words and racist message, acting as if they are the Islamists, so people would feel the fear is real. Uh, oh, and to clarify, this this campaign, this this organized campaign, uh, is working for the Ahok side or the incumbent governor side. So at the time, the idea there there could not be a disinformation for Ahok side because the narratives was the one doing this kind of disinformation campaign is. Islamist and Islamic populism only, uh, as government has been cracking down on uh, Islamist and Islamist campaign. And this brings us back to this bulletin. So the bulletin was found two days prior to election. And what is interesting is uh, the, the bulletin was not posted, the screenshot, the photo of this bulletin was not posted by this, this, organization, this organization campaign, this information campaign, but was posted by influencer. It was only picked up later by the disinformation ops after it went viral and the disinformation ops themselves in claimed that they, they did not know who made that bulletin so between the disinfo ops themselves there's an aura of secrecy that they don't really know how the other teams operate and what are they actually doing on the field they just pick up stories that align with their mission and disseminate them uh, anyway um the point i'm uh, making here that uh, from from these stories that um, uh, to answer the previous question, the initial question, uh, what what if people with high digital literacy, people that are fami familiar with social media, can can curate their persona such as influencer, uh, uh, are involved in disseminating this information? So, uh. Sorry, what's this? Sorry. Uh, so for them, they are not just disseminating, but they are curating uh, uh, info misinformation because uh, uh, they think this could help them in unraveling uh, the difficulties in understanding politics in Indonesia. So they they save they save those disinformation, those photos, those videos to their phone as a precaution, as a precaution, as a safety me measure in case those posts will be taken down by uh, Twitter uh, or if somehow those posts won't show up in the timeline in the future. One informant cited the case when suddenly a hashtag that criticized the government in the 13 suddenly disappeared. So there's also a sense of secrecy in algorithm because people are not sure how the algorithm, how the Twitter social media platform work, not knowing no, not knowing how they work, they, 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 they spread and save, create 
those disinformation as as a safety measure. So the conclusion in understanding this information, we need to pay attention to imaginative communication, how people use media, and want to contextualize themselves when they are spreading this information. And digital literacy might not be enough as an answer in uh, solving this information. Okay, thank you. I hope I'm uh, not being confusing. Thank you ever so much. Uh, no, it was perfect, perfectly to time as well. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, so, Anna Rinka, are you ready to? Yeah, okay. Would you like to share your screen or are you just talking to us today? Uh, no, uh, I'll, I'll be just talking, thank you. <laughs> okay, fine. Off you go then when you're ready. Yes. Well, thank you a lot for organizing this webinar series and for giving me the chance to present. Um, my presentation is uh, entitled uh, Discretion and Doubt, Altern Alternating Modes of Molding Uncertain Truth. And in this presentation, I will elucidate how people in Morocco collectively create their secrets in their everyday interactions by alternating discrete and doubtful stances. And I will show how both discretion and doubt are tied in with and build up uncertainty in productive ways, generating and shifting up social ties between people. And I will elucidate this today by um, taking you along to the, with the particular story of Jamila and Abdallah and how they got married. Um, Jamila and Abdallah were a married couple in their 30s when I met them in 2015 during my fieldwork in Morocco. Um, they took part in my PhD research um, for which I conducted 14 months of fieldwork in 2015, as well as a follow-up in 2018 in the region of Schirat Nera. And this is um, a region alongside Morocco's Atlantic coast in between the cities of uh, Rabat and Casablanca. But I was a bit further inland in the countryside uh, where most people make a living through a combination of agriculture, small-scale trading and uh, business ven ventures, but mostly uh, farming. And without many stable employment opportunities or substantial state support, most of the people in my research relied on their extended families to make ends meet. And one vital way for fam families to extend here is through creating ties of marriage. And in my research, I inquired how men and women in Morocco make room to establish marriages, as well as relationships outside of marriage. And I focused on cross-sex relationships, so between uh, identified as a man and a woman, and same-sex relationships and the topic of homosexuality falls out outside the scope of this research. Um, now, similar to marriage, uh, sexual relationships outside of marriage embodied pleasure and opportunities for both women and men in my research. Um, however, identifying as Muslims and as Moroccans, they generally also marked um, marriage as the respectable and religiously sound uh, place for couples to openly be together, whereas out of wedlock relationships, they denoted as shameful and sinful and also illegal in the state of Morocco, and therefore in need of remaining secret. And then I researched how men and women and families in this area create couples' marriages and how they keep relationships outside of marriage more or less secret. Um, and during my fieldwork, I interviewed not only the men and women in a couple, but also multiple members of one and the same family. So in Jamila and Abdallah's case, I interviewed Jamila, but also her mother and her brother um, to show different perspectives. Now, at first, Jamila herself told me that their families arranged the marriage. She said the ones who proposed the match uh, were Abdallah's father and her own father. And these opening lines fit into hierarchies of gender and generation because uh, she has the older male relatives running the show here. She said they arranged the marriage. Nonetheless, and emphasizing this to be a secret, Jamila later told me that actually Abdallah had already been her boyfriend uh, long before their fathers ever thought of a marriage. And she emphasized that their fathers definitely should not know. Um, and this was a secret. And in general, while they were dating, they had kept this completely secret and nobody knew. That's what Jamila told me. Now, of course, she was telling me, and um, I have and then made her story more anonymous um, by making their names also pseudonyms in order to tell you. Um, and 
when they had been dating for a couple of years, Abdallah got engaged. And not to Jamila, but to another woman entirely. And Jamila and Abdallah broke up. And in hindsight, Jamila emphasized that at the time she was not set on staying with Abdallah either. He was free to go off and marry someone else. However, Jamila said she pleaded with him on another point. And I quote, just don't have a wedding, I told him. Just keep it at engagement, get married, but please do without a grand wedding. Um, to have the whole neighborhood dance and clap at Abdallah's wedding, knowing he had discarded her, she explained, was too hurtful. Um, and she really cringed. Uh, I could not bear that. Um, because everyone knew, everybody knew we had been together. And her earlier statement that nobody knows makes for quite a contrast with her point that everyone knew. And this goes for many cases in my research, points at which people stress that nobody knew about an out of wedlock relationship, contrasted with other passages in which they stated that everyone knew. And as Jamila relayed to me how she and Abdallah had been dating secretly, more and more people indeed appeared who had known about their out of wedlock relationship. She had told her sister from day one, before Abdallah had been her boyfriend, he had just asked her on a date and she immediately told her sister. And she also told other people, other relatives, neighbors, and actually a lot of people in her life knew about um, their relationship. And moreover, Jamila, as well as Abdallah, dependent, dependent on these knowing people to make their out of wedlock relationship possible because her sister would cover for her. She would tell their parents that she was out, on a uh, out shopping with her aunts and not on a date with Abdallah. So her sister would cover for her. And also, Jamila said, various neighbors will definitely have seen her with Abdallah. And she counted on them to look away, to ignore the couple and surely not tell her parents. The secrecy was a matter of cooperative, cooperative discretion. Uh, Jamila and Abdallah counted on others to provide cover and to look away when knowing or suspecting that the two of them were in an out of wedlock relationship. Now they also counted on knowing others to make their marriage happen discreetly. Because in the end, Jamila and Abdallah did get back together and marriage each other. And I will get back to the mayhem of how they got back to, together in the second part of this presentation. But for now, um, they made the transition, like many other people in my research, they made the transition from an out of wedlock relationship to a marriage by counting on cooperative discretion. They had their families arrange the marriage as though their out of wedlock relationship never existed. Um, and to this end, Abdallah approached his father um, and he asked to reach out to Jamila's father and Jamila talked with her mother and sister and they talked with her father so that when Abdallah's father reached out, Jamila's father was already amenable to the proposal and they uh, made the match happen and they indeed continued to marry uh, publicly. And all the while they kept acting as though the marriage really had been arranged by these fathers and there was never an out of wedlock relationship. Now as to Jamila's father, they assumed that he actually might very well have some sense that Abdallah once was his daughter's boyfriend. But as Jamila emphasized, the main point is that there's no explicit mentioning of this possibility, and thereby other people do not and cannot know for sure what happened. So there's plausible de deniability also. She was being respectful by not mentioning her out of wedlock relationship to her father, and her father was being prudent by not asking her about this possibility and having the marriage go through. And on both ends of these secrets, people are actively involved. On the one hand, they actively work together to conceal their own and other people's relationships. And on the other hand, they also actively look away and make sure not to know about intimate relationships that others apparently conceal. And in this mode of discretion, family members, friends and neighbors share partial secrets in various configurations and simultaneously leave others guessing as to what they might know exactly. Jamila assumes her father might have a sense, but she doesn't know whether he does and what he then knows exactly. Now these um, discrete configurations tie in with the concept of uh, public secrecy and um, public secrets are easily defined as things that are generally known but cannot be talked about. And I appreciate this webinar series definition put forward that it's about something that's privately known but can be publicly talked about in specific ways. So it can be talked about with only in specific ways. Um, nonetheless, I would still turn this definition around. 
to me, the power of public secrets lies not as such in that something is privately known, but can only be publicly talked about in specific ways. Um, to me, the power of public secrets lies more in, in that something is generally more or less known, but that this general knowledge cannot be tied with certainty to specific cases. So in Jamil and Abdallah's case, without question, their marriage looked exactly the same as other people's marriages that were arranged by their families. Um, but that also made me wonder when someone else said they had been in an arranged marriage, maybe that's what Jamila said. Who knows what else happens? And that exactly is the point. I don't know. And other people in my leadership also do not and in general cannot know for sure either. So on the whole, in this region, people know that some women and men have out of wedlock relationships, but they generally do not know for sure whether their daughter or their uncle or their neighbor is or isn't in an out of wedlock relationship. So they cannot tie this general knowledge with certainty to specific cases. And this uncertain this uncertainty makes keeping secrets all the more possible. Now, people's collaborations, uh, this creating of secrets in a mode of discretion is based on and builds up such uncertainty. And mutual discretion thereby leaves ample room for doubt. And that is the other side of this equation. The mode of discretion of looking away um, exists simultaneously with a mode of doubt of people investigating matters and trying to ascertain the present presence of out of bed locked ties. Um, discretion and doubt alternate, alternate in ways in which people handle knowledge and uncertainty about each other. And in Jamila's and Abdallah's case too, there were different phases of discretion and of doubt. Um, to get back to when Abdallah got engaged to another woman and he and Jamila broke up, at this time Jamila decided to travel abroad. She went to work uh, as a domestic outside of Morocco. Um, and since she had broken up with Abdallah, she didn't inform him, but he did notice. And he started calling and um, asking where she had gone. Uh, and he showed up at, at her older sister's house, who wasn't supposed to know about their uh, relationship. And he started calling her parents' house and talked with her mother. And then her older sister and mother started calling Jamila, like, what's happening? This man is asking about you. Um, and they had huge rows. And um, Jamila denied everything because at the time they were broken up. He wasn't her boyfriend any, anyway, so she denied ev everything. But her mother and sister didn't look away. They kept asking uh, what had happened. They kept inquiring. They called her a liar. And then when she came back home on leave, this only increased. They had huge rows. Uh, they, they wanted to know what was going on, what was happening with this man. Um, and then Abdallah insisted on meeting her. And he um, actually wanted to break off his engagement and get back together with Jamila and marry her. And in the end, they decided to go ahead with that. So then Jamila had to go back to her mother and say, well, actually, after weeks of arguing and denying any involvement, uh, I want to marry him. Uh, we actually were involved and I want to make this marriage happen. And at this, that point, to Jamila's mother, uh, the best way forward was also to arrange the marriage. And she went to talk with Jamila's father. Um, so, to recap, um, in, this, um, in these events, uh, Jamila's mother, for one, went from discreetly ignoring her, the possibility of Jamila having a boyfriend, she mostly left her alone, to uh, a mode of doubt, of actively investigating what had happened and really wanting to know, and then back to a mode of discretion in the arrangement of this marriage, and also telling me that it wasn't uh, prudent for her uh, to inquire what, what had happened between her daughter and uh, her husband at that point. Um, now, to me, um, there in, in, in these stories, there's this constant alternation of discretion and doubtful modes in approaching each other. But the main question is not merely whether people look into a matter or look the other way, but which people investigate or leave aside whose matters in hierarchies and power dynamics. To inquire into other people's affairs becomes meaningful in revealing potential commitments between people involved in their social networks. And this, this does not merely pertain to the relationship of a couple, in this case, Jamila and Abdallah, but to inquire into their relation becomes meaningful in revealing the connection between them and their entire social network. 
So for Jamila's mother to investigate Jamila's out of wedlock relationship is not simply about her daughter being with Abdallah, although her questions were very much on the topic of whether or not they had a relationship or whether or not they had sex, but it is very much a question about the relationship between Jamila as her daughter and her mother and who Jamila is going to be within their family. Um, and for, for them to arrange the marriage did not simply cover up the previous out of wedlock relationship between Abdallah and Jamila. It also meant that Jamila wasn't going to go back to work abroad as a domestic. It meant that Jamila was going to stay in the region and be literally and figuratively close to her family. Uh, and this is also what Jamila uh, wants it, um, uh, here because she very much wanted to marry Abdallah, but she also wanted her family to accept Abdallah as a fine husband and be part of their family. Now, in conclusion, to grasp how people collectively create their secrets, the modes of discretion and doubt equally matter. And focusing on discretion, the way people also police and scrutinize each other in doubt easily slides from view. When focusing on doubt, the way people also discreetly leave each other be is easily overlooked. Um, in dealing with and crafting on certain knowledge, people alternate between looking away and looking into a matter between discretion and doubt, and thereby people claim and uphold their stakes in each other's lives. These alternations between discretion and doubt are a matter of people settling into what kind of connections and commitments they envision to be uh, their social networks and molding uncertain truth on how they might fit on how they might continue to fit into each other's lives or not. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you ever so much. I think there's many links there we can make between the papers, so I look forward to discussing that afterwards. Um, okay, so we'll move on to um, Gareth. Hi, I'll just um, share my screen. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, can, you can see that, yeah, right? That's yeah. fine, perfect. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation to be here. I'm, I'm really glad to be here, really thankful to be here. Um, so in my PhD viva, my, one of my examiners, um, after <laughs> examining the PhD, in which I don't talk about secrecy at all, uh, said that everything's about secrecy within this group, and I just hadn't, hadn't realized it. So this is my first attempt to, um, to, to tackle, tackle that uh, kind of critique and suggestion, um, and it, it's, it's very much a first attempt, but um, I'm, I'm gonna read if that's okay. So there's no better way to keep a group secret than to refuse a name. And this is true of the up to 2 million strong Christian following I'll be speaking about today. They refuse a name, not explicitly to stay secret, but because the group is a following of the Chinese Christian reformer Watchman Ni, or Ni Toshang in Chinese, and his protege Witness Li, um, or Li Chang Shou who based their ministry on a rejection of the Western denominationalism characteristic um, of the early 20th century missionary Protestantisms that they grow, grew up with. Um, nonetheless, the group is perceived as often dangerously secretive um, partly based on rather good evidence. Um, it's not only that the group has been perceived as closing its doors to outsiders, but that an ethic and aesthetic of hiddenness pervades the following um, all the way down. So when is supposed to have been um, quite clear about his the policy of, on secrecy, writing of the following in 1970, um, that uh, so Swanson puts it this way. Puts it this way, and he had an interview with a witness, and he writes, um, "This church has no publicly written history, no public documents, no tidy statistics. Our work," said Mr. Lee, uh, "is done in secret." So, being a, a neologism uh, alongside many other neologisms in the group's dense distinctive vocabulary. Even the term used for secret, uh, midre, uh, in the movement is, is a secret. So um, within the group too, the secrecy of its knowledge and inner workings are often relished. Besides the many songs and books on secrecy in the group, the extent of its membership is often reiterated, is often reiterated, is unknown. Um, well, on last count, there were 128,000 members in Taiwan. In China, members suggest there are anywhere up to 2 million. This unknown mass of is a source of both relish and unease. Um, so in this paper, I trace the role of secrecy as an embodied practice in the group from its anti-imperial origins in the 1920s to today. 
This approach reveals secrecy not only as uh, occluded knowledge, but as a sensorial experience of enclosure, hiddenness, and social density. Um, so followers differentiate themselves from what Nian Lee called uh, Christianity, not only by their focus on the nameless unity or oneness in their, in their terms of the church, but by the, um, the nature of their relationship with God. Rather than being um, in external communication with God as such, members understand themselves um, as being collectively deified and individually they refer to each other as, as God men, uh, Shenren in, in Chinese or God persons. So the emulation of God on a collective scale rather than the indiv individualized worship of him per se is thus um, central. Moreover, God is often described as hidden um, in the church, um, which is the church being a general term that members use to re refer to the following, um, in its description and experience reflects this hidden quality of God. So for instance, um, I can't help but see the built aesthetics of the group in Taiwan and elsewhere in East Asia, uh, where most of my fieldwork research has taken place since 2014, um, as more secretive than other Christian groups there. In contrast to the semi-iconic red neon crosses, which dot East Asian cities like Taipei and Seoul, um, the very sizable property for portfolio of the following uh, is often marked in a very subdued manner, using symbols um, using symbols that most followers themselves don't know the meaning of. Um, on the inside of these buildings too, there are references to secret blessings. Um, oops. Uh, so on the, the inside of these, this inside of these buildings too, there are references to secret blessings and the mystery of God, and of course. Uh, there are the song, song lyrics, such as those in the title of this talk, which celebrate having found the secrecy of living, the secret of living. The pervasive hiddenness of the group is completely reversed um, once every four years, when up to 30,000 followers march through the streets of Taipei wearing bibs, holding banners, um, and with a troop of drummers at the, at the helm. The ritualized nature of these tele often televised, publicized gospel marches, um, as they're termed, seem to confirm the opposite aesthetic of concealment, which characterizes the quotidian life of the group. Um, so the group is premised on socio-spiritual oneness with God and with one another, uh, and contrast this with the hierarchy and denominationalism of Christianity. Nonetheless, there is a very effective, highly implicit structure of authority within the group. Um, and I've represented it um, here, uh, pyramid style. Um, it's nonetheless not a diagram that would be embraced within, within the group itself. When I ask about eldership um, and who takes what position in the group, I'm often, often literally shushed. Um, the reasoning behind this is that authority flows organically uh, from God and is not a matter of man-made hierarchical reasoning. Nonetheless, authority in the group um, is a classic case of what Tao Sig terms the public secret. Um, once in, a, in exasperation with my man-made reasoning, a friend within the following told me that once um, he had publicly questioned the authority of one elder, um, only to immediately break out in severe acne, the scars of which have never left him. Um, so to draw out these secrets in a more uh, analytical key, the remainder of his paper will explore them in two registers, as political responses and tactics, and as embodied psychogenic sensory experiences. Um, it's frequently been noted within anthropological treatments of the subject that secrecy is paradoxical, it relies on others being exposed to its existence for it to have any social potency. But otherwise, the secret is only significant to the degree that it can be revealed. But in a classic anthropological and somewhat party pooping move, I'll suggest that secrecy is much less paradoxical in practice than it may seem in theory. Namely, I'll argue that the jobs of telling and keeping shared secrets, the revelation and concealment, um, at least on the scale of the following I'm describing here, are often assumed by two different sets of people. Loosely, the extrovert gospelizers and the introvert um, deep truth seekers. The risk of appearing out of, out of date, I want to make some room again for personality within anthropology, not as a trait, a trait of, a, of a society, but as a dynamic intersubjective ingredient to all sustainable human collectives, uh, and one key to understanding secrecy as a social phenomenon. So there are two sides to the political origins of the following's emphasis on secrecy. Um, in the first, the secretive uh, aesthetic and ethic of the uh, is the work of political mimesis. In late October 1921, on the outskirts of Fuzhou, church spires rose up from a bustling, um, smoky cityscape. At this time, the Western missionary presence was still strong, um, 
though following the Boxer Rebellion and the May 4th movement, this presence was increasingly awkward. In one corner of the city, three young Christian enthusiasts uh, met in secret. Uh, Ni Shutsu, uh, who was later to become Watchman Ni, gathered together um, with two Christian friends, Ada and Lee Lan Wang. They met unbeknownst to the Methodist and Anglican priests, parents and educators who had thus far found their experience of Christian power so closely and so alienating, alienating me with England and with the missionary enterprise. Um, missionaries, Watchman Ni once complained, treat Chinese Christians like they were just um, just a kind of little toy terrier to be taken up and set down without their opinion being consulted. At Trinity College, Fuzhou, uh, where Ni was educated, an Anglican priest would administer the Eucharist perhaps once a month, um, after which a prayer for England was uttered. The shadow of imperialism seemed to hover over every um, communion service, Gracie May writes. The elements tasted foreign, the table setting looked unfamiliar, and the prayer honoring the crown of England sound like a betrayal of, of China. Uh, Christianity was a Western import and had little to say to patriotic, patriotic Chinese uh, youth at the turn of the 20th century. So on that October evening, Ni snuck away from his mother's house for fear of reproof uh, to meet Leland and Ada. Baking their own Eucharist bread, the three blessed broke and ate it themselves. Ni would later recount, I will not forget that night until death, even in eternity. That day heaven was so near to earth. All three of us were so joyous that we cried. Um, this would be recalled by followers as the first meeting of the uh, so-called recovered church, the resurrected body of Christ, after centuries of degradation under the uh, auspices of Christianity. So sidestepping the priestly administering of the Eucharist in church and school, these modern followers say that in those early days of the group, these pioneers would break bread together um, whenever they felt like it. So taking hold of the most powerful symbol of the West, the sacrificial body of its God, Ni, Leland, Ada, and those who soon joined uh, their passion filled clandestine group denied divine power to the Western Church, took hold of it themselves, and consumed it directly again and again. Um, from a humble, humble wafer emerged uh, a heavenly vista. In sneaking away from parents and disobeying their church and school, there was a sense of wrongdoing, but it was only in the act of wrongdoing that they could receive the grace they had encountered in theory as a living grace in practice. It was only in wrongdoing that the opacity of uh, Anglican ritual could be remolded into an intimately hidden and mysterious presence of divine mediation. So the other side of the political origin of secrecy in the group is more pragmatic. So during uh, New Year 2015, I went on a trip around Taiwan with three couples. One was Taiwanese, one Taiwanese American, and the third um, Chinese. So my, my routine uh, of video recording the meetings and encounters we had along the way, as do uh, many of the, the followers themselves, was disturbed when the Chinese couple reacted with deep worry to my recording them in church settings. The following lays uh, claim to being the first on the Chinese Communist Party's infamous uh, evil cults list, Xie uh, Dao, established in 1999. Um, and since 1949, many followers of Ni and Li have been imprisoned, tortured, and killed under the communist government. Um, not least Ni himself, who died in 1972 after 20 years in, in a prison camp. Like so, so many other uh, so-called house churches in China, the church has developed strategies to evade the surveillance of the Chinese state. No doubt this pragmatic need to hide is uh, inflected in the group's distinct ethic of secrecy and its visions of a hidden God. Um, okay, so now I'll, I'll move quickly, um, hopefully I've got time, onto a more intimate account of the nature of secrecy uh, here, before concluding with speculations as to how the political and sensory aspects of secrecy might intersect. Um, so the degrees by which secrecy is embraced within the movement varies by, by member. One member in the UK with grey hair, tattooed, gym-toned arms, and a strong Plymouth accent, spent every day loudly proclaiming uh, Nee and Lee's ministry to anyone who would listen um, or who dared not run away. Like him, there were many members in Taiwan who were renowned for their gospel work and, for, and were considered uh, made for such roles. Another member in the UK I encountered told me that a church elder, much to the... Um, Letters told me and a church elder, much to the latter's uh, discomfort, that he and his wife habitually snuggled together under a blanket, uh, which they draped over a radiator. Analogously, there are many members in Taiwan who are much more inclined to embrace the church as a safe, secret enclosure. If these anecdotes appear random, my point is only to remind us that it takes all sorts to compose social collectives. Uh, more specifically, social groups rely 
their continued existence upon the complementary dynamics of distinct personalities, um, a point we seem to perhaps have left behind uh, in post-functionalist anthropology. In their phenomenological account, uh, ch uh, Childhood Secrets, Max van Manen and Bas Levering explore the developmental functions of den making, withholding information from parents and other forms of embodied secret creation. While Carl Jung wrote that secret keeping was a vital mode of what he called individuation. Yet more appropriate, um, more appropriate to my argument is perhaps Didier Anzier's notion of the skin ego, developing Freud's characterization as the, of the ego as first, as a first and foremost a bodily ego. Anzier critiques Lacanian modes of the unconscious based on language to argue that the experience of touch and subsequent fantasies of skin as a site of containment, inscription, and contact is a more therapeutically attuned um, focus. Put crudely, Anzier's uh, patients have developed thicker or thinner, more sieve-like or war-like psychosocial envelopes. It seems to me that the embrace of secrecy could well be a response to an unprotected um, skin ego. And the embrace of publicity, on the other hand, responds to a perhaps overdeveloped skin ego. Um, so if the skin ego is developed by varying degrees through varying media and in specific childhood contexts, then we might think about the habits of um, secret keeping and secret telling as lying along a psychosomatic um, spectrum of personalities. In both Taiwan and China, um, there have been extended periods of mass surveillance by both government and among citizens. How does this impact um, experience of, experiences of or inclinations towards secrecy years later? Does perhaps Christian uh, gospel withholding and telling provide a controlled register of Fort Da like recalibration of one's psychosomatic relations with the world? Thinking through secrecy and beginning to think the following itself as an infrastructure of concealment and revealment, which might or might not fulfill certain psychosomatic functions that the outside world has failed to provide for followers. Moreover, um, might we cautiously, cautiously think again with secrecy in mind that through, through the possibility that collectives possess certain qualities, ratios, and patterns um, of personality? That's, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you ever so much. Um, there's so much in there to, um, to talk about, isn't there? Um, I'm just kind of frantically finishing my notes. I think there's lots of really nice links between the papers there. Um, and also linking back to some of the, um, the results that we found in our own uh, project on the, on the Stasi. Um, yeah, you had, you had a round of applause there I could see in the background, that's fantastic. Um, particularly around issues of uh, secrecy and certainty, I thought came up really nicely, as well as issues of secrecy and, um, and hierarchies there. Um, I can also see we've still got quite a few comments uh, in the chat. Does anybody want to pick up on any particular points or have any specific questions for our speakers? Yeah, Rosalie. Thank you. Yes, it's just a tiny question to you, Anne Rienke. Um, yeah, you talked about these out of wedlock relations, and I was wondering whether there is a certain, let's say, interest in knowing about certain relations when it comes to children born out of wedlock. So is it at some point sometimes relevant to prove certain connections to admit knowing them? What, what happens to, to the dynamics that you mentioned when children are involved and perhaps questions of inheritance, of subsistence, you know what I'm hinting at, I think. Um, yeah, I was actually waiting for you to finish to know what you're hinting at. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, when there are children involved, then um, the, yeah, there are complications um, in, in this sense. Um, and actually, my, my previous research was on uh, adoption practices in Morocco, and um, yeah, uh, about one third of the cases in my in my research on adoption uh, concerned children who were adopted who were who had been born outside of a marital union. So I, I quite delved into that topic uh, at the time as well. Um, at the same time, um, yeah, the issues of um, 
uh, children being recognized uh, and inheritance definitely a matter, of course, but in the in the context of, of this topic of keep keeping secrets on out of wedlock relationships, then the stakes are, of course, higher when there's a pregnancy and a child uh, involved. At the same time, to me, what I found striking is that the dynamics are very similar. So uh, whether uh, the dynamics of collaborative discretion, of moments where it becomes very important to uh, dive into a matter in, in doubt and wanting to assert, and okay, but who, what happened here, uh, what, what went on exactly, and then people going back into this mode of discretion, like, okay, there has been an adoption arranged, or this child, well, a lot of people know that well, this child was born outside of marriage, but we're carrying on as though nobody knows, because the, yeah, the stakes and commitments are uh, solved again. So to me, the dynamics, and that's exactly why I chose not to uh, give an example of an out of wedlock birth, because that immediately gives so much um, yeah, extra um, scandalous tension in a way, whereas to me, the dynamics are very similar. So that, that would be, uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Any other questions directly to you? Okay, Robert's put one um, in the in the chat. I'll just I'll just read that one out. So, Anarienka, does the potential for children outside of marriage encourage out of marriage relations within families rather than outside families? I'm, I'm not entirely sure whether I, I understand the question. Uh, no, I, I, I honestly, if you could uh, elucidate what the question is. Uh, yes, okay. So I'm thinking of in uh, the context of the Middle East and Central Asia, where the potential for these types of out of marriage relations occur predominantly on what we would perceive in the West to be incestual and that they're within the clan, they're within the extended family, they're with the cousins or the brothers of the husband so that children can't be discerned to be outside of the marriage because they're actually very related. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, well, no, I wouldn't say that. No, I have no indication for any, any such assumption. Um, for sure, there is, um, yeah, there, there is a different sense of uh, how far away related cousins are. So uh, marriages between cousins are, uh, well, not, not common, but they're, 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 they happen and are, are considered normal. So in, indeed, uh, cousins, cousins aren't considered too closely related to get married. Um, so, so that part definitely uh, is true. Um, but this, this, this to me, that th definitely does not have any connection with with whether or not people uh, will have out uh, relationships outside of marriage. Um, it's um, it, it is a matter when when there's a child born outside of uh, marriage between a couple. There are still uh, so many ways to discreetly um, uh, manage the situation. Like I said, the this, the, the dynamic of, of cooperative discretion is is as uh, uh, works in similar veins. And there are, there are all sorts of ways. So adoption is one way to have a, a concealment that, that works. Uh, another way, a very simple way is to get married. So that uh, once um, uh, a woman is, is pregnant to, to marry her boyfriend and then the child is born within the marriage. So, um, and, and this is this, yeah, I, I've investigated lots of cases and at the one hand, it's like a huge problem and uh, there, yeah, there is this uh, frantic uh, concern and also uh, th these cases become problematic. And on the other hand, there, there, there is a, a common, uh, common ways of, of maintaining these as secrets that, that are livable. So yeah, I would take it more in that direction. Okay, thank you. Um, Gareth, can I just pick up on, um, sorry, Robert, did you want to come in there? I just said thank you. Okay, fine. And um, Gareth, one of the things that really intrigued me, you made some really interesting links about um, forms of identity um, and, and understanding of secrecy and community identity. But, but you said about um, followers, um, when you were talking about the aesthetics of the, of the built spaces, um, you, you said something that, 
uh, followers don't even know the meanings of some of the symbols that mark the places. And mm. I found that that really intriguing. So if this is so much part of their identity and the lived experience in these, these urban sites, how, do, how does that work? I mean, could you just say a little bit more about it? Because it's not something I'm at all familiar with. Yeah. Um, so the actual, uh, the actual lettering, which says this is usually a, a church is just marked by saying, um, so the neighborhood in which I worked was, was called Jingmei. So it'd be just church in Jingmei. Um, but their, their term for church is actually one that no one else in, in Taiwan shares because they, um, they came up with them, the witness they came up with them, them themselves because he didn't want to be associated with the, the Christian term for church. Um, so it's quite oblique in that sense. But usually there's these two symbols either side of the, the thing, which are Greek lettering. Um, uh, and I've asked many members what, what they mean, and most the vast majority don't know know what they mean. But some even just have the the that symbol on their on their door. Um, most people live in apartment complexes, so um, yeah, when you're walking up the apartment, you can tell a tell a church building just by by that by that symbol, which kind of evokes the fish in in you know in ancient Christian times as a as a secret symbol. Um, but my my sense is um, again it's a kind of relishing secrecy as a, as a kind of sensory hiddenness. Often um, hours and go, minutes and hours are spent uh, poring over the kind of symbolism within within the Bible. And there's a sense in which getting to the bottom of things, of this kind of secret symbolism is a, is a, is a form of uh, personal development as well as kind of identity formation. Uh, and also this kind of, the newness of the idea of deepness um, it's quite hard to phrase without sounding um but people often want a deep selves it's like almost a new a new idea that this this idea of having a deep being deep uh, was quite a, a kind of embraced notion which um was associated with, with these activities of unpacking symbols so um yeah i just was trying to push towards a, a sensation of the embodied feeling of secrecy being a kind of um exploration of in a, the inner self or a production of an inner self, which maybe wasn't wasn't there. But yeah, in terms of the symbol, um, yeah, it's it's just, I don't know what more I can say beyond that most people don't, don't, don't really know what it means. Um, but yeah, I think it feeds into this, this sense of kind of unpacking symbolism being related to a kind of sense of hiddenness and, and deepness, which is, which is a, a kind of aesthetic that's in, embraced for its own sake. You know? Yeah, I think one of the things that we've been looking at in, in our in our Stasi project is thinking about different media of knowledge and media of secrecy mm. um, understood broadly in terms of me mediums, media forms of representing oh. um, and, and forms of forms of knowing. So I, I think it's really it's really interesting to think about those the, those in relation to these different um, papers. And I was wondering. Um, in relation to that, Pradeepa, um, talk then very much about um, Twitter as being originally seen as, as more authentic, but then as, as a source of knowledge, one where there's this complete lack of certainty in terms of where the sources originally come from uh, and how then they get circulated and, and, and people then having, um, and I didn't know this term before, the, the hyperhermeneutics, so reading between the lines where the whole point is that there's a lack of certainty, isn't there? You can read things in, in multiple directions, which I think was, is really fascinating. Um, I wonder whether does anybody want to um, draw back to any of the uh, any of the earlier papers? Has anybody got a question for any of the other speakers at the moment? Yeah, Batil. You're still on mute, Batil. Sorry about this. Yes, I actually wanted to, to follow up on this notion of Twitter as a media of knowledge. And I was struck by this notion of the, um, um, the Twitter secret, which seems to be um, analogous to um, the concept of the public secret. But on the other hand, it does seem more graspable. I was wondering whether you could elucidate on this concept you introduced, no, public um, a Twitter secret, and um, it doesn't seem as elusive as 
as what we generally understand as a public secret, as has also been discussed in, um, in the other papers, that there there is this um, uncertainty is kind of predominant in, in this notion of public secret. But there seems to be a difference when we talk about the Twitter secrets. I wondered whether you could elaborate on this a bit more. Obviously, this is addressed to you, Pradeepa. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah, so um, so Twitter is in at least in uh, 20, in 2017, it, it was perceived as a platform uh, which is more authentic and uh, which is more genuine compared to other platforms and in Indonesia because there is a distrust towards uh, mass media, mainstream media, and also the distrust towards towards government and not only government but also politicians in general. Uh, Twitter is seen as a platform or perhaps a domain that is less editorialized, less uh, there's there's no there's no uh, uh, there's no filter here, there, so people can uncover those um, those that are considered as public secrets through Twitter. So, uh, but but this but this was uh, a few years ago. Of course, as today, as because um, back then people were were not uh, aware of the disinformation operations, and people perceived Twitter as a place that was very genuine, authentic, and uh, their their ways to curate information and spread information there is seen as a ways to uncover what what um, the government or the mass media do not want or or reluctant to 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 uh, um, reveal, um, yeah, um, am I making sense? Perhaps I can elaborate a little bit more if there's a question. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Padipo? Feel free if you would, otherwise I'll bring in Rosalie or Batil. Oh, no, not yet, perhaps. Okay, Batil, did, did you want to come back? Oh, sorry. No, 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 sorry. Okay, Rosalie. Yes, thank you. Yeah, well, I wanted perhaps to relate back to Anna Rinka and to um, I think very important points that she makes regarding the relational context of these dynamics of knowing and keeping something secret, which I think is very important to consider. So not only um, well, in how far these, these dynamics of concealment and revelation that also Gauss mentioned are something that are done in a social context and that where well, often we talk about, um, at, at least for the Asia and Pacific region, notions of compassion and good sociality include ideas of watching each other, taking care of each other in the sense of really looking at what are the others doing. And there is some surveillance aspect to it, isn't it? So that I think the right kind of caring form of interaction is also, as Anna Rinke mentioned, looking away not noticing it, um, which I think is also at first perhaps counterintuitive. And I think it's a very interesting point. And the second one is also that not knowing, uh, concealing <laughs> something is also quite productive. So not only we think that knowledge is always good and more knowledge is better and empowering. We can see here again in this case that uh, also in Gareth's case, of course, not knowing something actually is also empowering. And um, so I think there are two very innovative points in this. I'd like to hear the others' opinions on that. Yeah, thank you. I also would like to hear the others' opinions, but if I may, um, yeah, this is exactly uh, what for me is, 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 is really crucial. That, that looking away is a matter of, of also of caring. It's, it's, uh, so this, this surveillance is not only a matter of control, it's also a matter of caring. And to me, the moment when, when it would flip from discretion to doubt was really when in other areas um, as well, there were doubts about someone's um, being out of bounds. Um, but I wanted to link to a, a point that, that you talked about earlier and now raised again, is that um, looking away is, is a way of, um, uh, yeah, is also empowering. So that, that, that looking, uh, not knowing, 
evade having to act on knowledge um, and that that can be uh, a way to evade uh, power also so that for people in powerless positions it, it is an empowering uh, way. I would like to add that looking away is also a, way, a, a, a matter of enforcing power so the people in positions of power who look away thereby also not have to act and this goes on all levels for states for example, not to know about migrants and to leave people without papers is a way of looking away and not knowing um, that uh, allows uh, people in power, as, such as states, uh, not to act on, on, on these uh, um, people who are in their care, uh, so they don't have to take them into care. And it, the same goes in the level of these families, because for these fathers who are overtly uh, the heads of the households, for them, to look away and not know, just such as Jamila's father, is also a way of him asserting his authority by not, not explicitly knowing about this out of wedlock relationship, is also a way of him overtly and uh, uh, maintaining his authority um, in that sense. So to me, it's a way of evading power, it's looking away, and it's a way of asserting power. It works, it works in both, it's generative in both, on both sides. Um, but yeah, <laughs> Before I um, I can see we've got a question from Batil and Ansam. I just wanted to give Gareth or um, um, Pradeepa a chance to come in if they have any responses to Rosalie's point. Is there anything you'd like to add before I take the other responses? Yeah, perhaps I just want to add also to add uh, my response to Dr. Batil. So I think the concept of caring, especially in Asia Pacific, is interesting because um, in, in Indonesian Twitter at least. Um, there is this notion if someone is uh, spreading this information or spreading the wrong information, someone else will correct it. So those disinformation will be spread on Twitter and uh, if it's actually wrong, people believe someone else will chime in and correct it. But because the nature of secrecy, the, the, the nature of secrecy of the information that is being spread, so it, it's kind of difficult to correct or uh, um, debunk the information if uh, if it's actually wrong because in Indonesia there is a term called informasi A1 or sub, uh, very confidential information from um, from uh, close circles and those kind of disinformation is usually um, prefix uh, or label as informasi A1 or A1 information so those uh, those make it difficult to uh, verify uh, um, this information, the, the, the secret information. Um, perhaps that's all from me. Thank you. Okay, Gareth, do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, I was thinking of um, Enrico and um, Rosalie's point about the kind of relationality of secrecy or and uh, looking away or looking toward being kind of in one context, maybe a form of empowerment or, or the opposite, depending on um, within at least like there's an overview of the anthropology of secrecy from 2014. And it very much puts emphasis on secrecy as a kind of relational, mediatic, um, uh, social phenomenon. But sometimes I think maybe secrecy as a um, secrecy gets lost as a kind of actual ex experience of actual people and the relishing of, of a secret as a kind of something that can't be completely thought through in terms of social di dynamics. Um, so within the Chinese context, obviously under the uh, Maoist government, uh, secrecy, secrecy was very much associated with uh, surveillance, not just from the government, but from other people. So my thinking is that there's a kind of contagion there in terms of thinking through the, the secrecy of the self. If, if Arthur Kleinman talks about the kind of divided self of um, Chinese people coming out of um, Maoist, the Maoist regime, being this kind of strong divide between a public self and a private self coming from the sense that you're always under the surveillance of the people around you and also surveilling them too. And um, that kind of basic quality of the experience was kind of, uh, was kind of damaged in a way. And that Christianity maybe um, in some contexts allows people to re-experience re, uh, re secrecy as a kind of um, empowering, but also a kind of just in, experience secrecy 
for its own sake to some extent uh, as a kind of developmental experience but also as a just kind of sensory experience of the self uh, and sometimes maybe so i was thinking in terms of anarika's context is is there not also because often it seems like secrecy is this uh, i like really like this term collaborative discretion and you really get a sense that um it's a totally kind of intersubjective tactical kind of um phenomenon but is there also not like the relishing of kind of gossip and, and secrecy keeping as a kind of experience in it itself which which can't always be reduced or not reduced or related to social context like the, the kind of quality of secret keeping might might be kind of similar across all these different situations in which secrets perform different um, functions or perform different kind of social social roles is there a kind of quality of gossipy secretness which is kind of specific to that to that context i don't know if i'm hopefully i'm making sense by sex so bring it that way but, um, that um, was a question for Anarika. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I like the idea of uh, innate gossipy secretness. I think it's, you know, <laughs> whether whether it's it's transcultural or transnational, whether there's something essential to this this gossipy secretness. And um, I I'd like to give Anarika a chance to come back on that, but I'm aware that Batil's been waiting for a while with her question, and Selma wanted to come in as well. So um, maybe Anarika, if you, you can be pondering uh, your response to that while I ask um, Batil for her question as well. Yes, um, actually, it's a very brief one because um, I was struck by um, the concept of uh, the phrase looking away as being um, empowering. But I wondered and I thought maybe we, we, we need to be a bit more watchful in terms of terminology because looking away is not not knowing. Um, so maybe we would need to um, looking away is ignoring or being in denial and I wonder whether this would change the kind of discussion somehow okay I think um I think we can we can come back on that again in a moment but and Selma did you want to come in as well so we can bring the comments in the round yeah yeah I would uh thank you so this uh there's a couple of things I think um I'd like to pick up on um with Pradipa, I was I was wondering whether what's what's going on is is a kind of catfishing for information. Just to tie it back a little bit, maybe to the first part of the of the session, that by putting out assumed knowledge or suspicions on on Twitter and and partially also already expecting them to be corrected if they're wrong, that's a way of trying to build some kind of information, catfishing for it in in the situation where there is secrecy by by a powerful other, by a regime. So I think, I know in anthropology, we talk a lot about context, context matters, but I think it's, it's also a question of how, how the different actors we're looking at are positioned here as to how the dynamics work. So I think that's maybe what we're seeing here where the secrecy is being done by a powerful other. And there is a, is a sort of catfishing for information or knowledge. Um, it's in, in Annalika's case, um, it's what struck me was this kind of active involvement in creating secrecy that it takes work and, and it takes everybody to actually participate to create and maintain the secrecy. Um, but I also wondered how you're, um, you created this tension between discretion and doubt, which highlights the agent, right? It high, or highlights the agency of the actor, of the individuals involved in the story. Um, how that maps onto the slightly more traditional um, tension, concept tension of concealment and revelation, which touches on what we've talked about now, this point that wherever there is secrecy, there's got to be a degree of knowledge, because otherwise the secret has no power. Right? So if you don't know that there is a secret, then there's no point in, in, in the secret. So the looking away then also always already entails a degree of knowing, of knowing that there is something and that I, I'd better pretend that I don't know about it and that um, I don't want to gain any further knowledge about what might be going on. I'm, you know, I'm averting my gaze, I'm doing something else. And that is what this active involvement in maintaining secrecy highlights, I think, which is, which is quite interesting. But I think talking about it, as concealment and revelation or as discretion and doubt puts the emphasis on slightly different 
looks at it from different vantage points. One case, we're looking at the actors, and in the other case, we're looking at, at secrecy as something slightly more abstract, maybe, um, which I think is interesting. Um, and then really interesting with, with Gareth that secrecy is required by a powerful other because there is surveillance, there is oppression through the Chinese state, similar to Pradipa's case. Um, but the secrecy is taken into the belief system, so it becomes part of the, of the cosmology of this group, um, which I think is, is really interesting. And all of those cases are also the, the earlier ones, I think, one of the questions that maybe arises, and, and I think it might have come up earlier in the discussion, is the question of what's at stake. So what's at stake for whom has an impact on what the dynamics are, I think. So that's just, just some of my reflections at the moment. Could I respond? Uh, okay, so, uh, sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, Anselma, for, for this point, because I, I was trying to, they on time, so I skipped the whole page in my in my paper, and this is exactly what I, I had. Yeah, your point. That's I would completely agree because to me this question and and doubt I presented them now as opposite stances, but to me they're also they're very much complementary. So they're both grounded uh, in uncertainty and also built up this uncertainty because if there's no assumption that there's something there to know there's no incentive to look away like, exactly like you said and if there's no assumption that there's something to know there's also no in, in incentive to investigate so uh, yeah so to me that the opposition is is a is also a complementary um their complementary modes um and um also i very much agree like i really wanted to center the actor and not as individuals but as a social network so to me it was very important to really make it secrecy visible as, as embodied knowledge. I very much appreciated that in um, someone's presentation in the slide. It's, it's an embodied knowledge. And I, I wanted to do that instead of the concealment revelation where it remains very abstract. So that was a conscious choice. Um, and to go come back to Batil's uh, comment that looking away doesn't mean not knowing. Um, yeah, that ties in with, yeah, there is an assumption of knowledge. So there's knowing that there might be something to know that's already there. But another point to me is this uh, separation between those who take part in the cooperative discretion and who know, and the people who don't know and look away, that's not so stark. Because it's, it's very unclear what anyone ever knows. Because I, um, uh, so Jamila told me that she and Abdallah had been, uh, that, that Abdallah had been her boyfriend. That doesn't, people then assume they were sexually intimate or that they had sex, but actually nobody knows that. Um, and, and so the people who are in the know and who take part in cooperative expression, they also know things to different degrees and at different times. It's not like there's a newsletter that goes around and everybody has the same chunk of information. It's like a lot of assumptions. And yeah, so, so the, it, that, that's also something that I really want to dive, uh, dive into. So thank you for that, uh, that question uh, uh, as well. And um, I think Gareth had a point about gossip. Um, to me with gossip, I'm really like, again, the power relationships are more important um, to me. To, to term something, something gossip is already, uh, well, it's, um, uh, it's already uh, dismissing the talk as talk between people who don't matter. Because when, um, for example, these fathers are talking about their son and daughter to get married, then that's not termed as gossip. No, they're arranging a marriage. They're talking about important things. They have the authority to talk about that. And, but when women are talking about an out of wedlock relationship, oh, then they're gossiping and not talking about important matters. So to me, the term gossip itself is, is uh, often let that, that those power hierarchies slide out of view. Um, so to me, that is important, but I would completely agree with you that the that talking about things that other people might not know and, and, and trying to get that confidence and trust and it, it, it creates an intimate sphere, sphere between those who are trying to tease that out, whether it's about other people or between themselves. So on that, on the sensory aspect of it, and also the pleasure in, in doing that, I would, I would completely uh, agree with you that that needs to be kept in view. So thank you uh, all so much. So we've, we've got some nice links back to the first set of papers as well. And I can see um, 
comments coming in the in the chat there yeah about the gendering of language and i would agree that just gossip is is it's a gendered term certainly in 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 english isn't it um and i wanted to go back to um uh, mark and bring uh, give him a chance to to come in there i can see what you said about um so different networks where knowledge or gossip is is or rumors are shared there and your, your point about um it was said that it was easier to outwit the Gestapo or the Stasi than to conceal something from one neighbour. So I think this overlap between familial and local surveillance and political state is really interesting and comes through in several of the papers. Mark, did you want to add anything to that or do you want to respond to anything that you've heard on the basis of, of what you said in your paper as well? I'm really sorry, but I've got to go away and teach. Um, okay. so. <laughs> That's all right. No, we won't put you on <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for your contributions. It's really important. Um, I wanted to ask then, and Salman, did you want to bring up anything, any of the links to any of the papers that you've heard um, in this session, second session? Hi, I'm sorry, Joe. I'm apologies. My I've had issue, issues with technology. No worries. No uh, worries. Um, I I wanted sorry. I, I do apologise, and I I don't want to mispronounce something because it's not my. Unfortunately, my screen readers decided to read people's name completely differently to what they are. Um, I just actually what was really interesting for me was um, I, I, do you know the 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 thing about marriage and. And, and and relationships outside of that is something that is actually sort of quite quite relevant to my own kind of a lived experience as 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 a Muslim um, within a community who also has a disability, and and what the thing I I wanted to sort of sort of ask or, or to kind of get a response was or from would would would, would be that really interested me was that um, if 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 is it's kind of what in, in relation to secrecy how how would you feel that honor and social class came into how people would respond or um kind of look away to a, a kind of a relationship that was occurring outside of marriage Um, is this a is this a question um, particularly for Anna Rienka or yeah? yes please yeah yes please um, yeah thank you so much for this question I'm oh, sorry <laughs> um, yeah to me I think um, that 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 honor and uh, respectability and uh, class very much comes into uh, all these uh, dynamics because um, a major um, motivator i think for people to uh come to the point where they do achieve this this publicly uh arranged marriage that's respectable and that everyone can get on board with and and can dance and clap and celebrate at the wedding um uh, yeah what, what one major incentive to to make all these discrete uh, arrangements happen is to indeed uh, arise as a, as a respectable couple, as a respectable person within a family that, that one can be proud of and that one wants to belong to. And that very much ties in with class dynamics as well. For example, um, yeah, the what would be the aspiring middle classes, people who, who want to move up would uh, have even more incentive of, 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 of making, uh, uh, of realizing that, that, that kind of uh, honorful uh, uh, family uh, relationships uh, out in the open, um, and but that doesn't mean that that in in higher classes or middle classes or lower classes, to simplify it like that, that it happens more or less. Um, people would also always point to the other classes, like no, we don't have out of wedlock relationship, but the rich do, the poor do. It was always the others, also in different uh, terms, who, who who were wild and unbound and decided this honourable. But uh, well, I followed up on all the stories, and but as far as I could tell, um, it was more or less the same in in all uh, uh, classes uh, that I could look into. It was more that uh, people in higher classes have more means to make different kinds of cover-ups, 
um, but people in lower classes also make cover-ups, they just do so in different ways. So to me, it, it, it all ties in together and I really appreciate this question. Um, it's, um, yeah, it, it's something to follow up on and always uh, keep in mind as well. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. Um, I'm conscious of the time and, and aware that people are, are finishing between teaching and, and everything else. It's busy days. Um, and Selma, did you want to um, finish with any concluding comments before we talk about the, the next seminar? Um, not too many, I don't think, but I think that these, the topics that have come up today, um, especially okay. around power, um, and uh, relationships, hierarchies, um, and the tension between knowing, not knowing, and, and questions of agency, different positions of actors. Mm -hmm. I think all of that will stay with us um, for the next few sessions. Uh, we'll probably be coming back to them, and it would be lovely to see you all um, return for those discussions as well, if you have the time, if you can fit it in. Um, so our next session is on Friday the 4th of March and we'll focus on more theoretical and interdisciplinary approaches and then we have sessions on the 7th of March and on the 9th of March as well um, and the final session looking unsurprisingly at methodological challenges in studying secrecy although today um, we've heard I think that in some ways it's maybe not as hard as it might sound. Um, but yeah, I think those will be really, really interesting conversations and I look forward to seeing everybody. The details are on the website, you can register through Eventbrite and I'm very, very sorry for the background noises, but the cat is trying to come into the room with the dog. <laughs> and I think they all just want lunch at this point, um, but thank you very much. So can I just say thank you very much to the speakers for the second part and thank you for all the fantastic comments and everything that's gone into the chat as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, a big thanks to GRIT for expertly organizing this first and all the other sessions. Uh, we look forward to more. Right. Goodbye for today, then. Bye.